Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back from the break. I hope you're feeling refreshed and you're enjoying conference because we are nearly halfway through our conference. So um, I'm your next host for the coming a few talks. And my name is Olga. I am based in the west coast of Ireland. So look at what an amazing uh, geographical spread for this conference we have. OK, um, so um, as you can see, I'm not wearing my pajamas. Uh, it's just because it's evening here, but I'm definitely qualified because I am in the convenience of my bedroom. So I hope that counts too. Okay, we have a few more minutes before we are going to start and our speaker is getting ready. So I suggest I play just some countdown, uh, countdown video for you and I will be back in a couple of minutes. Hello guys again, we're back now. So uh, we are going to start with our first talk after the break. And our talk speaker is going to be Jeremy Tenner, who is an advocate, developer, community, barbecue, motorcyclist, bicycles, this, that, and not quest lab. And he's going to talk about Pythonic mobility. So how I found a new car and paid zero dollars for parking. Okay, let's welcome uh, Jeremy. Hello. Hey all, uh, super excited to be here. Uh, joining welcome, you from- welcome. Joining you from Austin, Texas. I've uh, Brilliant. let me. I, I'll, I'll come back here so you can uh, you can enjoy the full uh, the full effect. Is it I a am, nice daylight still? Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm very much still in my uh, still in my pajamas. Hello to very um, good, very good. It's getting late at night now. Very dark. So yeah, you're lucky. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Good morning to our folks on the on the west coast. Uh, good afternoon for uh, people who are near me, and I suppose good evening for uh, um, anyone who's. Uh, way west of the way east of the water yes okay very good welcome again and uh are you ready to give a talk yes okay you go live now <laughs> <laughs> perfect uh let's see if we um 
can give you my uh, give you my deck. All right, uh, as was mentioned, uh, Jeremy Tanner, Penguin on the internets. Uh, hello, uh, hello to all of my Python friends around the world. Hello, friends from the future who are watching this on on video. And yeah, let's talk a bit about how um, I've been able to get around using Python. There we are. That's the yeah, that's the deck. And so uh, these days, I am uh, very much at home all the time doing uh, some some pairing either with the uh, the tiniest Pi Lady here, or uh, working with my team at Equinix Metal, bringing the, uh, the distributed team, bringing the good folks of the community bare metal and bare metal accessories. So uh, if we go back a, a few years, I would get around town using a service called car to go Now, car to go allowed me to rent vehicles for uh, rent them by the minute. Uh, I'm usually paying just uh, 30, maybe 40 cents a minute for uh, something classy like, a, uh, like the car here. Uh, while uh, while enjoying the mobile application, I also found out that Cardigo had an API that was able to be used. And so, uh, anytime an API is exposed, I like to take and uh, take and explore it and see what it has for me. Uh, I set up a uh, machine in the cloud and started every uh, five minutes or so making an API call that says, "Where are all the cars in Austin?" And what came back every time was a list of JSON locations. Uh, looked uh, quite a bit like this. It would have uh, maybe uh, at the peak of it, uh, low 200s of locations of all the cars that would be available for me to go and unlock with my phone and drive myself by the minute, either uh, downtown at the beginning of the day or at home if we were getting towards the... Uh, towards the end of the day. And so in human readable language, it would give you the address of where the vehicle is, um, its geographic coordinates, uh, the engine type it has, whether it's an internal combustion engine or some of the cars were electric cars, great for the environment and fun to drive. Um, how the previous person who had driven that car had rated the exterior condition, um, how much fuel it has in it. This particular car is low on fuel and so may not be the best one to grab. Um, if the, uh, what condition the interior was in, uh, the license plate of the vehicle, and uh, if you need a smartphone to unlock it, almost all of them you did, and the VIN number of the vehicle, which is particularly interesting because in, addi in addition to being a unique identifier, you can pull a lot of information um, who made the car, what, what factory that car was made in, um, how large it is, uh, how many seats it has, the size of the engine. And so uh, even though it doesn't say the type of the car here, you can, we'll be able to um, look at how we're able to extrapolate that uh, a little bit later. And so when looking over the numbers of car to go, I wanted to look at maybe, um, maybe just a week's worth of, uh, maybe just a week's worth of data. And so if we pop over to this notebook that I've uh, run already, uh, I, have, I have insight into the directory where those snapshots are being taken. Uh, you'll see at the tail of those snapshots, we have um, for every API call for the available cars in Austin uh, has been part of the file name is a timestamp, um, number of seconds since uh, the epic. And so that's how we'll keep all those organized. Uh, we'll list how many of them there are. Uh, and looks like about 16,000 of them, which ends up being two months of data. And so that's probably way too much. Uh, it's not quite necessary. We can probably look make a data frame. We'll be using pandas. And that data frame will take in those things that you saw that were in the... Uh, uh, in the JSON for every vehicle location. So the, the date that that, um, that that vehicle was seen, um, where it was seen, uh, its engine type, and, and the rest of the things from that JSON. Uh, we're going to slice just the last 2016 uh, 
uh, sightings off the end of that list of collected files because 2016 uh, divided by uh, 12 to get an hour, divided by 24, divided by seven, that's exactly one week's worth of car sightings. And so from there, we will take and import those into a data frame, um, had pre-run it because it was taking about three and a half minutes and in the interest of time, certainly more interesting if we, uh, if we take in a, I have that done already. And our data frame looks very much like this. So over the course of, um, over the course of that time, looks down here, we saw 400,000 different, uh, different car occurrences. And then um, since the VIN is a unique identifier, looks like there are, uh, if we run uh, on that data frame, uh, VIN.unique, it'll tell us how many unique VINs were seen and 270 of them were seen. So there's 270 different cars at the time operating in the Austin area. Um, and then going back to try and figure out what model the cars are, uh, the first, uh, we'll take and uh, convert that VIN number to a string, slice off the first five characters, and the first five characters can be plugged into a, um, a VIN decoder. And that VIN decoder will take and then um, tell you what sort of uh, what sort of vehicle you're working with. Um, in this case, those three are uh, two Mercedes and one of the uh, one of the smart four twos. And so we'll come back and look. So uh, have four hundred thousand different locations of the cars. That's in, that's somewhat interesting. There happen to be two hundred and seventy different cars that the service is running in uh, Austin. Also, all right. Uh, so many of them are those tiny cars, the smart four twos that are um, little uh, little two seat hatchbacks. Um, if you're looking for a Mercedes Benz CLA or GLA, the sedan or the wagon, there's uh, going to be uh, many fewer of those. Um, in that uh, pandas data frame, pulled out the time, uh, the timestamps where the most vehicles were seen. That happened to be a series of uh, a series of. API calls that happen between between 3 a.m. and 4.45 a.m. on uh, Wednesday morning. That means the network is, uh, when everyone's sleeping, that's a good bet that 80% of the network is uh, up and available at, the, um, at any given time. So even though we saw 270 cars, um, that means that about 35 of them at this point were uh, out for maintenance, out of gas, um, had been crashed, uh, stolen, uh, or otherwise had met a, um, a terribly unfortunate end. Uh, the time when uh, I saw the fewest cars was the API call that was made at uh, 5.20 in the afternoon on Friday. And at that point, 58% uh, of the uh, network was available. And so uh, that meant most of the cars were probably being driven by folks. If it was 520 in the afternoon on Friday, most of those were probably being driven home to, uh, uh, dr most of those were probably being driven home by folks who were uh, looking to commute. And so even at its lowest point, if the network has 158 cars available, that does seem like a lot. I should be able to get around, but we were talking about uh, uh, we were talking about latitudes and longitudes, which means these cars have locations associated to them, which raises the question: What good is having 150, 158 cars if they're 10 miles away? The point of having the car is not having to walk. And so, um, as we saw earlier, not so much the full story. Um, I'm looking for a car. I find an empty parking spot. This gives me just a little bit of the availability anxiety. I'm now trying to figure out when is the last car going to leave downtown? And so to try and figure that out, um, mapping is probably a good idea. 
And so to get into my maps, I needed to uh, use a service called Cardo, uh, mostly because I am not particularly good at JavaScript. And I like services that can um, make the points dance over time. Um, fun visualizations are nice. I did catch Martin's talk a little bit earlier, and I'll be reviewing it a little bit later. Um, these seem to have a, a, an excellent amount of, uh, of GeoPython tricks that I'm uh, looking forward to digging further into. Um, but it's also, uh, it's also possible to do it in, the, in a terribly hacky manner, which is, uh, I guess, what we'll look at now. And so after I took and, um, and uh, used that data frame to uh, do a little bit of analysis, um, it didn't make sense again to every time I wanted to use the places where those cars were, um, re-import the all of their locations from the 2,000 or the 16,000 different uh, snapshots that had been collected. And so uh, Pandas is excellent at moving that data and throwing that data frame to um, any format that you'd like. In this case, it's going to be comma-separated values called avcars for available cars. Over here, it's Pandas time again. Pandas time again may be a little bit larger. And so after bringing in pandas, I'm going to take those car locations and bring them into a new data frame. Look at that data frame, and it looks good. Uh, take those locations, and here we're going to do the uh, a hacky little cheat. So um, we have a magic number being subtracted from one of the columns in our data frame, the date, that number of, um, that number of seconds. 18,000 is the number of seconds in five hours. And those five hours are what we want to subtract from UTC to bring it in line with uh, the central time zone. Uh, again, in Martin's talk, I saw some uh, better ways to handle time zones. In this case, since uh, Cardo, the service we're going to look at using, wants um, both a, uh, a year, month, day instead of those seconds, We'll move the time zone. We'll do a two date time to uh, bring us over to uh, the correct format. And now we will look and see if that C date that we were, that column that we added is going to be in the right format. And it certainly is. We'll take that and then throw that back to another CSV. That CSV will be uploaded to the Cardo service, which I had done earlier again, in the interest of time. And that will give us a beautiful graph here. Beautiful graph of places. Beautiful graph of places called a map. And so this map is Austin, the greater Austin area. Uh, right now, it's 319 in the morning uh, central time. And so each of these blue dots is the location of one of those vehicles. The lap long just dropped right down on there. And what you'll notice is this area in the middle, about one square mile uh, north of the water, west of the freeway, is downtown Austin, uh, where I would often work, uh, meet friends, go for drinks, comedy shows and things, and need a vehicle. And right now, there is not a single vehicle in that little donut there. And so I'm going to try and figure out if I play these, uh, if I play these points, um, at what time do people start driving those cars into the city from the residential areas that they're parked in? And we'll play that now. So it's four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock. Looks like around six in the morning, people start getting to work. Those vehicles start coming into the core of the city, 11 o'clock, it's 12 o'clock, one o'clock. And you see over the course of the day, those vehicles at the end of the day start to, uh, start to disappear again from downtown. Now it's seven o'clock, eight o'clock, and, uh, and those cars are gone. So if we wait for the time to loop back around again, let's look, uh, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, good, 11 o'clock. And so two o'clock, all right, six o'clock, uh, uh, 16 o'clock, that's uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I'll still be able to get a car, still be able to get a car. Uh, five o'clock, they start getting a little bit scarce. At 621, there's only one car left and it's all the way across downtown. This means 
when I leave work, it needs to be before six o'clock if I'm going to look to collect a car. Now, uh, that helped me figure out when I needed to be um, uh, out of work to avoid the game of, um, avoid that game of musical chairs that happens when all the cars are gone. And, uh, and I continued. So later on though, I moved. And I moved right, right about here. Uh, as you'll see with the uh, points dancing again, the cars never go there. The reason the cars never go there is because that's outside of the car to go service area. So I was going to have to find, have to find a new way to get around. So the being, that was act a, um, how I paid $0 for parking car to go has agreements with most of the, um, city governments that it operates in that allow you to park the car in any legal spot. This was when it was operating. The service disappeared about, uh, disappeared about a year ago, but you only paid for the, the minutes that you drove, never for parking, which was a, which was a great setup. But again, I lost it when I moved. So when I moved a little bit South, it was time to, uh, time to figure out how to get a car. And it would be great if Python could get me a car. A car like I used to have. This is the Mark III GTI and a younger, lighter version of me. Uh, this, this was about 15 years ago. So I loved that car. It was a perfect mix of fun and practicality. Uh, I, I, I suppose it's the, the Python of cars, the, what, what with the fun and practicality and, uh, and, and space for everything in it. Uh, so so I, think I, want, I think I want another one of these. So they come in two different versions, um, of which the two-door, which you see here, definitely my favorite. Um, it's because I'm fairly tall. And the problem with the four-door, as you'll see with the, um, uh, you'll see with the headrest in this car, the B-pillar, when I turn to look, B-pillar directly in the face, which is not a great time. Um, the larger door makes it easier to get in and out of, and it's just a better look. There's a difficulty though. Uh, Volkswagen stopped importing the two-door GTI to the United States in 2017. And so if I want one, I'm going to have to find a used one. Um, that's not really a problem. People sell their used cars all the time. If only there were some sort of list of people with things that they wanted to trade for money. Um, and there is, it's Craigslist. And so uh, we'll uh, try and, and search Craigslist now. Uh, this is Craigslist for Austin. We're looking for GTIs. There's a handful of them. Uh, the, GTI, the GTI I want though is a 2016. The reason I want a 2016 is because that's the last year of the two door. And so anything newer won't be, uh, won't even possibly be that model. And it's the first year of the new electronics package that I was hoping to, uh, hoping to have in the car. And so it looks like in the city of Austin, there are two of these cars, which is somewhat useful. One of these is a two door. I'm not in love with the silver. We'll, we'll try and figure it out. There's probably Craigslist's in, in other places though. So if we were to look at a different region, like maybe, like maybe Boston, like maybe Boston spelled correctly. Yep, they have a couple, a four door, a four door, a four door, still not interested. This is going to take a very long time. Um, and so there should be some sort of way where, uh, some sort of way where we can look at a lot of places. What places does, Craigslist operate in. Okay, there's there's these cities here in the sidebar, um, about 23 of them. But there should be more there should be more cities than that. I've certainly been to more places than that. Um, there's a list of U.S. states. Okay, getting warmer. Um, Canada, too hard to import a car from Canada. Definitely too hard to import worldwide cars. Um, yeah, what's so in California? We'll see that when you open the California page, 
it will tell you where the major cities are. So Los Angeles is bolded, that's a major city. Uh, Orange County is an area, bolded, major city, Sacramento, San Diego, excellent. So the bolded places, hold that thought. All right, so we've decided on Craigslist. We know that we need more than 23 cities. Um, in that initial list of 23 cities, places we're missing like Kansas City, uh, St. Louis, uh, there could be GTIs in both of those places. Uh, we, we drilled into the state lists and we found that uh, if you look for the bolded cities, those are going to be the big ones, the most notable in that area. And um, I know that Craigslist doesn't really want you to do this, so they don't have an API. That would be much easier, but we're going to have to do some web scraping. So we're going to pair uh, requests with beautiful soup and let's head back to our notebooks. All right, where do we find ourselves? So the search string we were looking for, when we use that search string, we found those two cars. Okay, excellent. Um, remember the search string uh, looks like the, the city or the locale uh, is a subdomain, um, cars, trucks, automobiles, uh, search in that uh, category, uh, the name of the vehicle that you're looking for, uh, the beginning and end years that you'll accept, perfect. We'll bring in, we'll import requests, we'll import beautiful soup for parsing, and we'll look at the homepage of Craigslist. Beautiful soup will give us a soup of uh, soup of tags that we can then uh, move through since that's much more structured now. Uh, the sidebar is a series of unnumbered lists in a uh, class called uh, AC item. We'll look at that list and we'll see the same things that we uh, saw on the website, but in this case, uh, as HTML tags. When we look at the uh, first set of those uh, tags, that's Atlanta, Austin, Boston, Chicago. Okay, that's the 23 um, list of cities. Those are the ones that we're not particularly, um, we need more. Those are the states. Okay, perfect. Find every link from, the, um, from that series of states in that uh, unnumbered list. Great, we will take those, um, and those look like, you know, that'll give us California. Uh, the fourth state is California. That's a link that will then, yep, kick us over and we'll take, that's the page that we want to uh, rip through. In the interest of time, we're going to rip through. The important part is that we're looking for a bold tag wrapped around the city. If we find that, we're going to take and um, grab the name of that city and dump it into this pile of locations. This pile of locations is now a much longer list where we're going to find cars from. And we're going to now use one of my favorite web frameworks, handcrafted artisanal HTML tags. It's filthy, but also fun. Now, we have a print statement in here. What that's going to do is give us a quick and dirty uh, progress bar. As that gets closer to the, uh, as that gets closer to the bottom, it's taking and running that same uh, search string through all of those cities. And then it's going to give us back a HTML page, which I'll then kick open. And those are all the vehicles that are available on Craigslist in all of those cities. Now, if I do the same thing, but this time looking for images as uh, if I pull the uh, class that's result image gallery, on the search results page, uh, there is a uh, tag in there and I can pull that out and that'll give me the image. And so instead of looking over the, um, the text, which is somewhat useful, I'm a very visual person. For that, I'm going to want to see a pile of pictures, maybe wrapped in links. And so here, these are, these are what all the cars available for sale on Craigslist in the United States look like. This looks like a two-door one. If I click through, I can contact the owner and maybe get just a little bit closer to the car of my dreams. 
Now, that's exactly what happened. I found the exact car I was looking for. This is me inside my car. Now, I ended up finding it on, on an enthusiast forum instead of in the, uh, in, the, in the Craigslist ads. But looking through Craigslist that way did help inform my understanding of what things cost. I'll be around in the Discord and on Twitter. Uh, I'm Penguin in both places. Thank you so much. Amazing presentation and perfect timing. <laughs> uh, well done. Do we have any questions, guys? Just give me a second. I'll have a look at our YouTube channel. I think there is a delay with YouTube, so question might still come. But please be on Discord and make sure that you answer questions if there are any questions after that. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. To, happy to answer I any actually, questions. I actually have a question myself. Very yes. basic one. Yeah, so this application is like it has a perfect practical relevance. I was just wondering, how did you come to this idea of getting, uh, you know, getting starting, like, you know, researching this kind of problem? Like, it's more of practical relevance for yourself or, you know? Uh, so very much so. I I'd wanted to... Um... Uh, I'd wanted to find a car like the one I had. I couldn't buy it new. And uh, Python is sort of a, a hammer I'm, I know how to swing. And so the, uh, I like notebook driven development because you're like, okay, especially when doing web scraping, like, okay, well, look what's available. Okay, well, add a little bit more onto that. Add a little bit more onto that. Add a little bit more onto that until you have a, this sort of ball of madness. Yeah, and, uh, and you end up uh, having a lot. <laughs> And perfect use um, of fun as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, uh, I'm very interested to go back and uh, and rewatch the uh, Martin's talk that I that I saw earlier. Yeah. He did a lot with um, uh, geographic locations, and uh, I yeah. think I could, uh, no, I could clean mine up quite a bit. Into your, into your code. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you so much. I appreciate you uh, being here, and uh, you know, please ask questions on the Discord. Uh, everyone who's watching it. Okay. Cheers. Absolutely. Bye -bye. Enjoy the rest of the day. Cheers. Okay, guys, I hope you're enjoying it. We have a couple more minutes before we move into our next talk. So I'm going to uh, entertain you with some uh, sponsors videos. I think, guys, we are ready to go. We are still one minute ahead, but we have our next speaker here ready waiting for us. So I'll start introducing him. His name is Mario Garcia, and he's an active open source user and contributor for over a decade. So he's a speaker at tech and innovation events since 2008 and attended events in Latin America and in Europe. He's an active Mozilla uh, contributor and Mozilla reps, and he joined GitLab Heroes in 2019. So let's uh, in, uh, welcome our next speaker, Mario. Welcome. Hello. Hi, Olga. Thanks for the introduction. You're very welcome. Welcome here. Where are you based now? I'm in the southwest of Mexico. Wow, it's amazing. Is it nice and warm weather now? Yeah. How is uh, it? Is it nice? Is it summer? Or I suppose. Yeah, well, my city is always hot, so. Very uh, good. Uh, yeah, we are in cold winter. It's cold. I'm I'm based on the west coast of Ireland, so it's very cold and dark most of the time, and it's rainy. So you imagine I'm very jealous, and you know, to have weather like you have. Okay, are you ready to get started? Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Good luck with that. Enjoy, guys. So hello everyone. I'm I'm so excited to be here and sharing with the Python community again. What I'm talking about uh, today is uh, how we can use uh, GitLab CI as our continuous integration tool for Python project. I will tell you uh, uh, a little bit about it and share um, some cases scenarios where you can use GitLab CI for, for your projects. And some things that we have to consider uh, before uh, preparing our project for uh, deploying using this tool. So uh, I'm a GitLab hero. Um, I've been um, 
I'm a Silla contributor for almost a decade, and you can find me on, on Twitter as Mario GMD. Uh, before talking about how we can configure uh, a, a GitLab repository for deploying uh, a Python a project, uh, we have to know that when configuring uh, Heroku, or, uh, I'm talking about this platform, but but you can uh, use GitLab CI with other uh, cloud platforms like um, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, and and, and other uh, tools that uh, the GitLab CI supports. But um, we need to know that Heroku has a official build pack for, for Python, and it requires that, that we have uh, the dependencies file uh, in the repository. Um, it has support for um, for pipm, so you can have a pip file, or, or you uh, must create a requirements.txt file. And for the startup configuration, uh, we must create a proc file, so Heroku knows how to run our application. And we have to specify um, the version of Python that we are using for for the project, so Heroku knows how to how to install it. And there is also a, a build pack that has support for, for poetry, but some, something uh, we need to note about the Python support that Heroku offers is that it doesn't support um, shared libraries. Uh, there are some um, cases and areas where we need to have Python with shared libraries enabled, but Heroku doesn't support that. So in that case, we have to uh, containerize our, our application uh, using Docker, for example. And talking about Docker, there's an official Docker image uh, hosted on Docker Hub for Python and some other technologies um, based on Python like Django. But you can also uh, create a, a custom Docker image I have a custom Docker image that that I created last year when I was working on a on a demo for um, a web application built with Rust and Python. I will talk a little bit about it, but later. And talking uh, about GitLab CI, uh, there are some things that we have to know about it, and some of the the features that. Uh, the, the tool provides that are uh, that you can find interesting. So if you have a, a GitLab account on GitLab.com, uh, you will have access to the um, to GitLab CI, that is the CI/CD tool uh, that GitLab uh, provides with with the platform. It is open source. It has uh, good documentation. The, the official documentation has enough enough examples. How about how we can uh, use this tool? But um, there are there are also content available in the official blog of, of GitLab, and some of um, of the members of the program that that I'm part of, uh, we, we are writing some um, blog posts um, talking about some specific case scenarios where, where we can uh, use GitLab CI. Uh, when, and these are um, some of the most relevant features of, of, of this tool. But um, I would like to, to focus on the, the, the on the support for Docker. Um, you can configure uh, GitLab CI for building a, a custom Docker image and publish that image on, on Docker Hub, but it also offer um, GitLab offers the, its own container registry, so you, you don't have to publish your, your image on Docker Hub, you can uh, publish uh, an image that you will be using for 
um, the GitLab CI part or any other um, part of the project that you require to, to use a custom Docker image for. And well, now, now talking about how we can uh, configure uh, GitLab CI for working with um, a Python uh, app, uh, I will be talking about a Flask. Uh, I have a, a repository where you can find um, a basic example and some basic configuration. And I'm deploying this application to, to Heroku using GitLab CI. And there are some things that we have to do before we can um, have our application on, on a production environment. So uh, after we create um, a GitLab repository and we uh, sync that repository with the code of our application, we have to create some, some additional files for, for Heroku uh, knows how to um, properly deploy that, that application. We have to create a prop file. Uh, that prop file uh, will contain um, this instruction, this uh, line that is the, the instruction necessary for Heroku to know how to run uh, the application. Uh, we know that uh, if you are familiar with Flask, you have uh, you have a, ser a server, but it is it is uh, ready for production. So we have to use another um, solution like G-Unicor. So we have to add uh, G-Unicor um, also as, as a dependency for, for our project. So Heroku have uh, access to, to this command. And we have to create the runtime.txt file to specify the version of Python that we are using for, for the project. We have, uh, if we are um, using pipn or poetry, we don't have to create this file as Heroku knows uh, when, when reads um, the pip file and the pyproject.toml file that what is the version of Python that the project is using? And talking about the dependencies, um, depending on the way that we are configuring our project, we have to create one of these these files. If we create, uh, or we are using uh, Poetry or pipm, we only need these two this file or or this, depending on on the tool that we that we choose, and we can we can um, omit this this file as it isn't necessary. Uh, Heroku will know what version of Python is being used by reading uh, one of these files. And don't forget to to add a gitignore file. Uh, this is a website that that I recommend for creating the the gitignore for um, the technologies that you are using for for your project. Um, it has support for Python. Uh, we, we can uh, create a gitignore for Python projects or for Ross or for both technologies. And for example, if we are using um, poetry, we will require the, the build pack uh, that has support for for poetry. The official build pack provided by Heroku doesn't have support for for poetry, but uh, has support for for pipm. So um, if we uh, don't want to use um, this uh, configuration file for for the dependencies of our project, we can ex export um, the content of this file to a requirements.txt file. And uh, something that we um, must know is that if we are using the requirements.txt file, Heroku, um, when reads this file, we have to specify the version of Python that we are using as it doesn't 
has support for wildcards when we are uh, using our, the requirements.txt file. Then um, we go to Heroku, we have to create a new app at the Python build pack. We have to choose one, one of the two that, that, are, that are listed here. This is the official one. This is the one that has support for poetry. And then we, we go to, the, to our account and copy the API key. So we, we, will, be used, uh, we will be using this, uh, this key for the configuration of GitLab CI. This value is necessary for GitLab CI as it is the way to that GitLab has access to your Heroku account. Uh, we, we can we can provide um, a username and password uh, the, the way that that GitLab CI uses for accessing our Heroku account is by using the API key that um, that is created when, when we uh, register on the platform. So um, on a repository, I, I will show you uh, this in, in a few minutes, but uh, in the configuration of the repository, we go to the to settings, CICD, and uh, we in the variable sections, we uh, click on, on expand, and um, we have to add uh, this is the name of the variable and the value will be the API key that we copied before. Then we have to create the GitLab CI YAML file. That is the um, configuration file for um, GitLab CI. So here in this file, we have to um, configure the, the jobs that will be running when the pipeline is started. I just have um, a stage here that is the production stage, but we can run tests here. Um, and for deploying our application to Heroku, we will be using um, the Docker image of of Ruby, the version 2.7. And the, the important part here on the, the command that, we, that GitLab CI will be running is that we have to specify the name of the application and the name of the variable that we created before. So uh, after uh, we, we, we do this, um, the pipeline will start uh, running. And if there is no, no error, um, your application will, uh, will publish on, on, on Heroku. But let me show you um, a repository um, that I created recently. That there is a basic example of how we use uh, GitLab CI for deploying our Python application. Let me share another screen. Just a second. So I have this, um, this repository on my GitLab account uh, at the end of the, of the slides. It is the, the URL for, for this um, repository, so, so you can check. The, this is a basic project. Um, the important part here is, uh, well, I, I didn't delete uh, this file as I, I don't need it here, as I'm using uh, the requirements.txt file for um, telling um, Heroku what are the, the dependencies for, for the project that, that I will be deploying to, to that platform. But the important files here 
are the runtime.txt file that has the version of Python uh, I'm using for this project. That is the 3.8.6. And the prop file where we have to specify the the uh, instruction uh, for Heroku. So for starting the, the application while, once is, it is uh, deployed on, on the platform. And if we go here uh, in settings, CICD, in the variable sections, I have this um, variable that, that, is, uh, that contains the, the API key that I uh, copied for, from my, my account. Um, if we go to Heroku, I have, a, I have the app here. And if, if I go to um, the configuration of my account, the API key is here. So I have to copy this key that, that is the one that I have to uh, assign to a variable in, in, in the GitLab repository. And let me go back to the configuration. I'm using the official uh, build pack provided by Heroku, the, the one that has support for Python and for uh, PM talking about uh, the the way that we manage the dependencies of our project. And the content of the GitLab CI uh, YAML file is um, this one. This is the, the, the configuration that I did for uh, deploying this application. I'm, I'm not running any tests at this moment. That, uh, this is a basic example just to show you how uh, we uh, use GitLab CI for deploying um, any Python application. Uh, there are other additional configurations that we have to do uh, depending on the other technologies that we are using for building our project. But this is the uh, basic configuration for a basic uh, example uh, of a web app built with Flask. And um, let me show you the pipelines. We can see the in, in real time uh, what GitLab CI is, is uh, what instructions GitLab CI is running. And we can see here if there is any error uh, on the configuration uh, of the project or the configuration files that we have to create. We can see that here. Um, well, um, it detects that I'm using poetry. And we'll, um, we'll start. Um, building the, the applications uh, and then uh, it will uh, deploy the um, the code uh, to to uh, the heroku app that i created uh, before and this is a basic um, example um, but why i uh, why did i talk about uh, docker uh, there is uh, another um, case scenario that I, I want to talk about. Imagine that you are building an app, not using only Python, but using uh, Python with other technology. Uh, I'm also a Rust developer. And um, last year, I, I prepared uh, a demo for, for uh, another conference. And um, 
the idea uh, when I started uh, working on, on this demo is to know how I can use uh, both uh, Rust and Python for building application. And uh, something that I, I have to face is, is that there is not enough documentation. Um, the documentation available for the, the, the framework that, that I used for building a web application with Rust, but running um, part of the backend with, with Python. Um, there is not enough documentation on how to configure GitLab or um, the idea that uh, if you are using both technologies, you require um, that Python is built with shared libraries and uh, Heroku doesn't support that. So the, the best solution for that was uh, building, a, was uh, containerized uh, the application. And you, if you go to uh, my GitLab account, you will see uh, this um, repository uh, that, that the name is Rust Python demo. You can check here. Um, this project is also deployed to Heroku. But this time I have to create a, a Docker image. That Docker image is the one that I will be that I will publish uh, that I will use for publishing my app on Heroku. And uh, this is a, a Rust app that, that is using Python for for some backend um, task. And um, I'm using uh, Poetry for uh, managing the, the dependencies of, uh, of the project. And this is the configuration file. We have to first uh, build a custom Docker image by, uh, using the Docker file that is on the repository and uh, then publish that, that app on, on Heroku. I have this application here. Uh, let me show you what uh, this one. So this is the application that I that I hosted here, and I'm using GitLab CI for um, publishing um, for deploying the app on Heroku. But I have to containerize the app as for the the, the characteristics of the project. Um, and as um, Rust needed um, to have um, access to the shared libraries of Python. We have to change a little bit uh, the configuration, and I have the application running here. Uh, it will um, take some minutes to, to load, but uh, what basically what it's doing is a web app will build with Rust, but that web app has access to a Firebase database, and the access to Firebase is uh, done by using a uh, Python model, and this this is what you will see if you go to to the to the URL, URL that uh, Heroku creates for for the app. And this is documented. Uh, um, what I mentioned before about how we can use um, GitLab CI for um, for deploying a, a basic app uh, on Heroku, a basic Python app on Heroku. It, it is isn't documented yet. I, I will be working on a, on a, on a blog post that I uh, I will publish later. But let me. Well, so this is what I. Uh, wanted to share with you. If you have any questions, you can uh, find me on Twitter. Uh, there are also some uh, blog posts that I already published on, on depth. You can uh, go to my 
the account or and you can find the the first uh, repository by going to to this uh gitlab repository thank you so much it's a great presentation and um, let's see if we have any questions um Yes, there was a question there, but it's already answered actually, but I still read it for you. Where the GitLab Community Edition includes the CI CD functionality? We have an answer from uh, other, you know, viewers, but uh, maybe you could um, talk about it a little bit more. Well, um, GitLab CI has been available for, well, I, I don't know um, for how many years, but I, I started using uh, GitLab uh, uh, two years ago, and GitLab CI was already there, and the support for Python and and Rust and other technologies, uh, um, GitLab CI has support for 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 those technologies. Um, some as, as specific uh, things related to the the projects that I, that I've been working on uh, are not documented, and something that I've been doing is writing um what i uh writing some uh, blog posts uh, about gitlab ci and how i've been using um, the tool for this kind of project okay thank you so much uh we don't have any other questions for now but uh if there are any questions i hope people can ask on discord or reach you on twitter thank you so much again and uh, have a great day and it was great to have you here thank you have a great thank day you. bye Okay, guys, we are, before we move to our next talk, I'm going to play some uh, sponsor videos. So I hope you, you know, some of you just join now. So otherwise, uh, just one more time. <laughs> Hey guys, great. So we are moving to our next talk, which is going to be a pre-recorded talk from uh, Michelle Brenner. She is based in Los Angeles and maybe she's watching it or probably not, but when she's watching it, uh, you know, hi, Michelle. So just to introduce her, she is a senior software engineer with a 10 years experience in uh, tech from engineering support to manager. So she runs an interview format tech podcast called From the Source that ex examines what tech jobs are really like. So in her presentation, we talk about how to host a podcast for 25 cents a month. She's going to tell you all you need to know how to how to set a podcast for yourself for that price. OK, just give me a second. I'm going to share with you her presentation. Um, share screen. Okay, guys, I'm so sorry. Apparently, we don't have uh, audio for this uh, presentation, so I'm going to try and share it once again, okay? Uh, give me a second. Share screen. Share screen and one share. I hope it's going to work right now. Uh, yes. And give me a second. Now I have to go back from the beginning.
Okay, guys, I'm so sorry. We have some technical difficulties. I, I need to find out how to get... Um, Hi, I'm Michelle and my pronouns are she, her. My presentation today is how to host a podcast for 25 cents a month. I Hi, I'm Michelle and my pronouns are she, her. My presentation today is how to host a podcast for 25 cents a month. I host the podcast from the source. I interview people working in tech about the good, the bad, and the boring. It's a way for me to feature underrepresented voices in tech while getting to speak to amazing people for an hour. Today, I'm going to talk about the podcast, more importantly, how you can start your own. The focus will be on how I use AWS and Python to self-host, but I'm happy to take any questions you have about podcasting in Q&A. Before we dive into the tech, let's talk about why you should have a podcast. First of all, no one can stop you. There's a freedom to knowing you can say whatever you want and be in the same catalog as Reply All or Planet Money. You can create fictional plays or talk about your day. There's no producer to tell you no. Some of my favorite shows are niche, like Burn Notice, where they built an entire podcast on watching a 10-year-old USA show. It's all about having fun and being passionate about your content. The only caveat to the no one can tell you no is that most podcast players use the Apple Podcast Catalog and they do have an approval process. However, it's focused on mislabeled explicit content and not nearly as much gatekeeping as their apps. Second, it's fun to learn new skills. It's also aggravating, but eventually worth it. Audio editing, marketing, and how to conduct an interesting interview were all skills I didn't have before I started my podcast. I'm still trying to figure them out, but seeing myself slowly get better is exhilarating. It also helps in other areas. Being able to ask insightful questions and draw people out makes me a better networker and a better friend. Learning to put myself out there for the podcast helps me market myself and get better opportunities. If I just walked up to someone and said, you're so interesting, will you talk to me for an hour while I ask you personal questions about your career? They would back away slowly. Instead, I say, you're so interesting. Would you like to be a featured guest on my podcast? And some of the time, they say yes. For some reason, when I tell people I host a podcast, they're often delighted and impressed. I didn't expect it, but it's a fun perk. It enhances your brand and it's a great icebreaker. Another reason to start your podcast is that it, you get a whole new community. If there's anything I learned about 2020, it is that I can never have enough people to talk to. I'm in a tech community, so mostly I talk to other people in tech. 
Well, I love all of you. It's good to meet people with different experiences. They might live 2,000 miles away and work in insurance, but you can commiserate on how bad you are at social media marketing. Finally, making money from podcasting. This is a trick. Uh, you will almost definitely lose money. You need a large audience as well as polished and consistent content to make any money in podcasts. If you're doing this as a side project, you probably won't have time to make that happen. But I'm here to make sure you lose as little as money as possible while still being worth it. Now that I've convinced you to start your own podcast, you're going to need to create a few things. First, you need the recording. I record using Zencaster, which is a cloud service useful for interviews. I edit with GarageBand because it came free on my MacBook. There are lots of other options out there, but I haven't explored them too much because these are working for me. Second, you need artwork. It is better to have different artwork for every episode, but I started with one logo and used it for everything. You need a JPEG with a resolution of 1400 by 1400. This is the Apple podcast standard. Third, you need an XML file with all of the information about your podcast. This is your RSS feed which allows aggregators to put your show in their catalog. It has information like title, description, and episode name. I will make a template available, but the place to get the latest formatting is Apple Podcasts. You might have been noticing a trend here where I use Apple Podcasts as my North Star. I do that because while there are 100 podcast apps, almost all of them reference Apple Podcasts. There are a few major exceptions like Spotify, and once you're ready to have your podcast aggregated, you will want to register them with as many places as possible. There are two ways to get your podcast on your friends' phones. You can use one of the many managed services. I'm not going to offer opinions on those because I don't use them. You can think of them like any software service. Either they will cost you a monthly fee or you pay with ads or with your data. Since I knew that the more money this cost me, the less chance I would stick with it, I want to see if I can manage the hosting myself. There are two steps to self-hosting. One is making the audio and artwork available to the internet. And two is creating a document for aggregators to know about your podcast. I pre-prep sample files for this presentation. And by the end of the talk, you'll be able to listen to my brand new podcast. Now I'm going to switch from these slides to the live demo. I'm sorry if you do the not Amazon have an AWS account, account page, or want to otherwise known as AWS. It asks you for a credit card. If you're completely you're unfamiliar with it, but if you're okay. careful, you should I'll have be explaining it as I go. For small projects, AWS is a generally a called S3. Free tier. S3 the is a storage services, service for files first thing you want to do if you by AWS. Account. To set up a it's button, similar to Google Drive, Drive iCloud, or Dropbox. I have mine warning you about files $2 and then decide to remove them. A link on how to do that is in the written in S3. S3. Is that S3 is focused Another on engineers and AWS is that they are changing things all the time. It's used to make money hosting massive sites like Amazon as well. Process. A few months ago, so the cost of your tiny MP3 is much more. Then the interface and order also connects to many other AWS services. Sadly, AWS does not send me alerts when they make changes that affect my free tutorials or their products. I wanted to point this out, not to dissuade or scare you, but just so you're careful when doing any, anything on AWS. Make sure to read through carefully and not just follow the tutorial, even mine. Okay, I guess that's maybe the end of the talk. <laughs> yeah, this is also my first time watching the talk, so I really have no idea. But so far, it's very interesting. I guess that's the end of the talk. Uh, right. Oh, actually, it's not. But there are some. Or oh, maybe there are some. Uh, some sound uh, error there is uh, embedded in the recording. Uh, I'm now logging in to get to S3. Once there, I'm going to create two S3 buckets. Buckets are similar to directories or folders to hold your files. One will be public for the audio, podcast, art, and XML feed. 
The other one is to store your log so you can track your audience. You don't get a lot of info, but it's nice to see how many downloads you're getting. First, I select the big orange Create Bucket button on the top right. This takes us to the form where I make the bucket. I am naming this especially for the conference, so you know I am making a podcast just for you. The only setting I am changing here is to make the bucket public. Having a bucket be open to the public when it's supposed to be private is a major security issue for many companies. So AWS wants to double check that you know what you're doing. When I'm making the lots bucket, I leave it private. Once they are both created, I need to actually set up the login. I've selected the new bucket and then the properties tab. I scroll down to server access logging. This is the simplest logging you can set up for your bucket. It is currently disabled, so I'm setting it to enabled. I am then copying in the name for the logs bucket I already made. The next step is to make subfolders for the assets before I can upload them. I am back in the public bucket itself. The create folder button is right next to the upload button. First, I create the RSS folder. That is where the XML file goes. Then I make the auto directory where the actual podcast audio goes. And finally, I make the images directory for all the podcast artwork. You can see the three folders I just made. Now I can upload the image and audio that I prepared. I go into the subfolder for audio and select the audio. Then I do the same thing for the image. Before I can upload the XML file, I need to edit it. It needs to point to those files that I am currently uploading. I need to select the file to see the object location. There are a few different ways you can version an object in S3. ARN and the S3 path are mostly used for internal settings. The HTTP path is what is needed. That is how our listeners access our files. I'm going to select one of the files I uploaded so I can see the whole path. Now that we have the location, it's time to edit the XML file. I have opened it in a text editor so you can see it. It can look daunting, but all I need to do is fill in the fields. At the top is a bunch of boilerplate for different RSS feeds. Most of this does not need to change because I already filled it in, like the name and description of the podcast, the audio length, etc. What does need to change is the location of the files I uploaded, which I'm adding now. I've already uploaded the XML file the same way I did the audio and image file. There's one last thing before I validate the podcast, which is making sure everything in the bucket is public. While I made the bucket public, that does not automatically make all the uploaded assets public. So I select all the folders then actions, and finally make public. This will make sure everything is accessible. I am now ready to test the XML file. I grab the object URL from AWS. I'm using a third party website to validate the field. You can see it checking that everything went well and I can even listen to the audio. Welcome to From the Source. I'm Michelle Brenner and I'm your host. Now, what would a Python presentation be without some Python? Before I let you test out the brand new podcast, I want to talk about the open source project. This is a repo where I keep scripts I've written to make podcasts easier to create. One is the editor that breaks up large audio files into pieces based on silence. I found that when I was editing podcasts, that was the first thing I would do. And then I remembered I was an engineer and wrote a Python script for it. It makes it way easier to edit and remove all the filler words like um, you know, things like that. My goal for this repo is to keep adding Python tools to the podcast, from automating the demo I just showed you to refreshing ads. On this final slide, I've shared a few different URLs. The first is a short URL I made from the larger XML object URL. I'd like you to take a minute and see if you can add it to your podcast app on your phone. There should be some sort of feature to add a private RSS feed. Technically, the link is public, but it's not searchable yet because I haven't told Apple or Spotify it exists. There are also links to my Dead Dead 2 blog, where I have a written version of this tutorial, and a link to the open source project I mentioned. Finally, if you're not sick of hearing me talk, you can hear my real podcast from the source. Thanks for your time, and I look forward to any questions you may have.
Okay, that's really the end. <laughs> Sorry about the confusion. I think uh, this video uh, has have some quality issue, and uh, I'm not sure why it is. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure why it is uh, a bit weird. So sorry about that, apologies, but uh, we would figure it out and then um, hopefully we'll have a better version uh, to put on the YouTube uh, after the conference. So you, if you're interested, you can revisit the talk. And um, yeah, so uh, so Olga is here. Yes, uh, I'm I, here. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that you are familiar with her already and because uh, uh, she's helping uh, me like uh, us <laughs> for an hour before. So uh, I would like to know, uh, where are you calling from? I am right now on the west coast of Ireland. Yeah, so you uh, are also in Ireland. and um, Yes, oh, are you in Ireland? <laughs> yeah, how do you know about us? <laughs> it's a question. <laughs> yes, so um, I am based in uh, Galway in Ireland. And uh, the reason I'm here is because um, I'm involved with uh, Python committee in Ireland just helping out to promote Python. And, uh, you know, we're trying to, you know, give us give some spare time uh, to, you know, things like this. And it's an amazing experience. So I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, so I know that uh, you're also involved in Python Island. Is that's it, correctly. Yeah, so are you help organizing or? Uh, well, I haven't been uh, helping that much because uh, we didn't organize any events for the past, uh, you know, this well after February. So we had no chance to, to go, you know, for proper event. But yes, we are looking forward as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I think it must be a good experience because I have been to Ireland uh, last year for the uh, conference in uh, in Dublin. And also I was there actually, too. Actually. <laughs> yeah, I have also visited Limerick, uh, which is another uh, city yes. in uh, in Ireland. February. And yeah, it's in February. It's just before. Yes, the I was there too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I uh, how how do you like the Python community? Have you have experience like that before? Well, uh, uh, I think it's growing. Like it's amazing to see uh, you know how many people are getting involved because you know on a day to day basis it's very hard to see. Like I'm I'm in research, so it's just mostly me doing Python and other people like you know the program maybe other languages or not at all. So it's very nice to get you know you know to get together with people like minded so we can get you know get some experience from each other yeah so how long have you been using python do you mind um <laughs> yeah no i don't know let me say see i'd say for five years now wow five years. yeah well but you know i i do research so i you know program but i it's not my main activity so i program on the site yeah five right. years so it's it's a uh, how long have you been involved in Python Island? Is it since last year or? Uh, it is since uh, this summer, past this last summer. I think we. Since last summer. Yeah, yeah. well, this summer, 2020. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's good. We are good. We are glad to have you uh, on yes, board. Yes, I'm delighted and... to be part of it. <laughs> yeah, that's really great. And uh, yeah, so uh, you know, we are a very distributed team, and we have people from different places. So uh, myself, I'm from London. Uh, I, I'm based in London. I'm now calling in from London, and Olga is uh, calling in from uh, Ireland. And um, so yeah, hopefully, because uh, we we have a team. You know, uh, later today you will see uh, some of our hosts from uh, India as well. So yeah, Amazing, we yeah. do have. A a big team so yeah i hope that uh, you know if you're interested if any of you watching are interested to uh, help out uh, hopefully we'll have another one next year um then uh, please reach out uh, our twitter mailbox is always open uh, we do actually have some uh, people uh, you know put their hands up and uh, uh, you know volunteers themselves uh, by sending us messages we do have a uh, uh, volunteers coming from uh, you know come from canada from uh, you know from uh, uh, North America, like from, you know, uh, just just like come in, jump in uh, by sending us message on Twitter. So that that's a really good experience. And yeah. also thank you, Olga, for helping. Yeah, uh, it's a pleasure. I would be I would be curious to to know like geographic spread, how many different <laughs> countries or we have speakers from, or you know, or helpers, volunteers, just to understand like how big it is. Yeah, and I also see people, you know, in the in our Discord channel, and then there's the self introduction. People are from everywhere. I'm really yes, glad. Yes, yes, I read it too. Yeah, I, I'm super happy about that. I hope that uh, everyone is enjoying, and also make sure that you put on your pajamas because we have a competition in um, in our Discord channel. There is the pajamas showdown.
Uh, so, Olga, have you seen the pictures there? Is, is really Not yet, pictures. but I'm going to get ready in a moment. <laughs> yep. So, uh, yeah, make sure if you are in your pajamas, put your picture there. And so you would be entering the competition. You would get a chance to win uh, one year of the uh, JetBrain uh, license that uh, you can use it to get a Pai Cham for the whole year, which is uh, worth up to uh, 69 pounds. Uh, I don't know how much is, it is in your own currency, but uh, it's, it's actually quite a, a good deal. So uh, yeah, enter the competition, even if you don't want to join the competition, even if you, you know, then you can just go in and see all these crazy pictures and vote for them. Uh, we vote by putting the thumbs up emoji. Uh, make sure that you click on the emoji of a few that you really like. Uh, don't, don't like everyone because <laughs> then it will be very difficult to choose which one is the most popular. Um, but yeah, please uh, go in and vote. Uh, we would let people play this game and vote uh, till. Uh, so the earlier you come in, the more votes you would get, right? So please do that. And um, so we would stop the voting uh, at the last talk. So uh, we would announce the winner in our closing session. Uh, you know, how many hours from now? I, I can count maybe ar around 12, no, 11 hours from now. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think, yeah, we should uh, maybe take a break, get another hot chocolate. <laughs> I love chocolate. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then uh, we can play some uh, message from our sponsor and then we would uh, welcome our next speaker. Yeah. Thanks so much. OK. Bye, guys.
Okay, so uh, I hope you're refreshed. Uh, how about your um, hot chocolate? Did you put marshmallow on top? I love hot chocolate with marshmallow. I'm learning how to make homemade marshmallow so I could make some hot chocolate. Okay, so uh, without further ado, uh, we would uh, start the next talk. So next talk is actually uh, by Zach, and Zach is a data scientist and also a uh, Python addict. <laughs> so yeah, I can't wait to hear his talk. So let's welcome him on stage. Hello, Zach. Can you hear me? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> yep. Uh, can you unmute yourself? We can't hear you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's not uh, listening. Hello. OK. Let's give him a few uh, minutes. So um, yeah, so uh, Lace is also actually at the backstage here. So uh, Lace, how about you come on stage and uh, we will have a chat while Zach is getting ready. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. I'm all cozy. I'm all, I changed my pajamas. Oh, you have, how many pajamas you have? <laughs> uh, a few, a few. Like with lockdown, it's like, it's the things that I own the most. I have more pajamas than I have shoes. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so uh, how like you you look like a unicorn right now. What have you done with your computer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my light is a little bit weird. Uh, yeah, my setup is it's a, it's a little bit weird these days. I'm trying though. I mean, a unicorn is a good thing to be looking like when it's <laughs> when it's pajamas. No. Yeah, now it's like, I don't know, like, because you told me I need to get some more pajamas and, and I'm not sure, like, uh, like what, what's, what's the tip of getting a good pajamas? Because I really like your picture in the uh, pajama showdown, by the way, vote for Lace if, you, uh, <laughs> if you're playing around. So uh, how, where, where did you get that pajamas? Like, how, where to find good pajamas? Any tips? I, I think that was a gift. So I didn't, I don't think I got that one from anywhere, but tip to get good pajamas well um get something comfy that's the first mm -hmm. thing then if you're somewhere that is cold get something warm as well <laughs> so that that's quite necessary uh and well yeah th those are my pajama tips for today yeah uh so uh do you oh i want to know do you have a fluffy slipper that's that's one of my questions I do. I have fox slippers. Um, they're not fox. around here at the moment, but I have fox oh. slippers. Yes. You should. You should actually like take a picture of the slippers well as to enter the competition twice. But I don't know whether <laughs> that would count as. Uh, yeah, count as the uh, the thing. So okay. So let's have a check in with Zach to see if he's ready. And um, yeah. So see if if the thing is okay. So okay. I'll see you later. Hello, Zach. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. So, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there were some uh, technical issues, and we always have technical issues. Don't worry, uh, our house hasn't burned down, so that's fine. Um, so, yeah, uh, how about you uh, take us away with your talk? What the struck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what the struck? Uh, okay, so uh, let me try this. I'm gonna try to hit the the big screen. Let me know if you can see full screen the title slide here. That's awesome. That's amazing. That looked good. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So my talk's called What the Struct. I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and jump into it because I know we're a little bit behind schedule. Uh, first, a brief introduction of who I am. Uh, so my name's Zach Anglin. I'm the director of AI engineering at S&P Global. I describe myself as a Python fanatic. I've been using Python professionally for about five years uh, as an amateur, a little bit longer than that. And I'm also a new dad. So I had I uh, had my first first kiddo about six months ago. His name is Malcolm. And like any new dad, I will make you all look at photos of him. So here's here's Malcolm uh, last week at the Thanksgiving holiday here in the US. But enough about me. I would like to talk to everyone today about like kind of a maybe a mundane topic, one that doesn't get a ton of a ton of press in the the modern Python world. But I want to talk about record data types or what we might call structs. So structs come to us from C, from the, the C legacy that Python has. Uh, I know everyone's familiar with it, but C, of course, is a minimal programming language. Interestingly enough, the reason it's called C is, became, is because it came after the language B. Uh, C is procedural, which means it has no objects. Everything just runs top to bottom. 
And so if you want to write a basic C program that would, for example, calculate the area of a rectangle, you would declare two integers, one's the length, one's the width, you'd multiply them together and then you print that out. So here our area would be 20. Uh, but if we want to do that for two rectangles, well, we have to declare uh, the first length and the first width, and then the second length and the second width. And then we have to calculate the first area and then the second area by multiplying the right numbers together. Then we'd have to get the area difference and then we print that out. So here the area difference is 22. And you can, you can see how as you're getting more and more complexity here, you've just got more and more variables to keep track of. And a, a big improvement over a program like this uh, can, can be made using the, the struct feature in C. So in C, uh, you can use this syntax to say, okay, well, here's a little basic compound data type that is gonna hang together. It's called a rectangle. It has two integers, one's called length and one's called width. So if you do this, then you can, uh, rather than keeping track of individual variables and making sure you have the right one going together, you can just declare uh, this compound data structure, which again is, is just, just a collection of primitive data types, collection of ints, where we've got a first rectangle, a second rectangle, and then we can access by name the length and the width attributes from those rectangles, get their areas, and then subtract them to get the difference. And this is a big improvement, but we can actually go a little further, right? Because now, uh, rather than just manually getting this, this repeated area calculation, we can define a function, and we can say that that function takes a rectangle struct. And, and now we can sort of enforce some safety here where you're not gonna calculate area on something that isn't gonna have a length and a width. So, so now rather than, uh, rather than manipulating the individual elements of a rectangle, we can just declare them and then call the area function twice. And we can even get a little bit more uh, structured than that. If we declare a second struct, one that is actually a struct of structs. So this one just contains two rectangles and we'll call that one rectangles. And we could declare a second function, so one called area diff, which takes a rectangle struct and then calculates the area on each of them. Well, now we've got basically maximum structure here, right? So th this is this is very reusable code. Uh, there's almost no hard coding other than the initialization of the two of the two rectangles here, and everything is just function calls. So so using a struct, even in a, a very minimal language like C we are able to get big wins for structure, big wins for readability, and big wins for reusability. A brief aside on structs and memory usage, C variables tend to be stored in specific memory addresses. So uh, if you use a struct, you can ensure that lots of variables that you have together are all being stored at contiguous locations. So um, they're all sequentially stored in memory. And then you can read and write the whole struct in binary as a single unit. So either into memory or into disk. So that's a big win in C, but maybe doesn't apply so much outside of there. So moving out of C and into Python, we also have a, uh, a struct module. So taking a look at it, a struct is a Python module for unpacking and repacking structs that are stored as binary data. It's only really useful for uh, really high performance code. We wanna take advantage of that memory, uh, that memory performance we talked about a second ago, and also interoperating with C. And it declares, it requires declaring something called format types, which I'll get into here in one second, just to give you a taste of what it looks like. Here we can say, okay, import struct in Python, and then we can use this struct.pack function, uh, declare this HHH, which I'll get to in one second, and say, okay, we're gonna pack the numbers one, two, and three into binary. And if we do that, we'll get this binary object where we can see we've got uh, a one, a two, and a three sort of scattered around these bytes in memory. And we could write this to disk, we could serialize it, but we've got this packed struct, which is actually equivalent to what it would be uh, in, in C. And this HHH is that format string that I alluded to earlier, which is a domain specific language for struct, which, um, which corresponds to this table here. So in this one, we used the lowercase h, which is a short. So it's an integer, which uh, which takes up two bytes of memory. And if we were to come back here and change that HHH and say, okay, well, rather than using a short, let's use longs. Uh, well, we're gonna wind up using a lot more storage for those same three numbers, one, two, and three. Uh, this is why it's, this is why the struct module is really important if you wanna be you want very fine-grained control over the exact amount of memory or the exact amount of disk that's being taken up by your data structures. 
outside of that, there doesn't tend to be a lot of usage of the, the struct the struct module in Python. Uh, similar to integers, we can do the same thing with characters. So if I wanted to store as a binary struct, the letters of my name, Z-A-C-H, well, I can say, use the format string C-C-C-C, -C -C, and then I'm gonna get this binary string, Zach. And I can also unpack binary. So, so just like I can pack to binary, I, I can unpack from binary using the same format string. So if I, if I pack up the letters of my name and I unpack that to a new variable called unpack struct, well, that's gonna give me a tuple of each of the, each of the characters in that struct. And in this case, again, the letters of my name stored in binary. Now, uh, looking again at this, it is of class tuple. Uh, what we got out of the struct was a tuple. And I just wanna zero in really close on that because it's, uh, it's key to the rest of the presentation. This is what I would call a what the struct moment. Because if you recall, the, the whole point of using a struct in C was that we got this we got this reusability by being able to access into the attributes by name of the struct. So we got to actually call the length name to get that first element of the rectangle struct. But if we're in a tuple, the only way that we can get into these the elements of the tuple is by indexing. We don't we we lose all of the names that the struct got us in the first place. So there's this this major piece missing. Uh, they, that actually gave us all of the the reusability in the in the the compound data structure that that a struct offers. So this is kind of a problem. And the solution that, or one of the solutions, one of the first solutions that Python offers to it was called the named tuple. Uh, named tuple is stored in the collections module. So you got collections mo collections .named tuple, and it's pretty simple. It's a tuple with names included. Just a uh, showing how we can use a name tuple to pull out the data in a struct. Well, if we take that same, you know, the letters of my name, packed and then unpacked, we can also declare, it's got this funky syntax, declare a, a name tuple where we say, okay, well, here's the name of it. And we have to repeat this twice. That's for pickling reasons. But we can just use a, a string delimited by spaces. We say first, second, third, fourth. And now we can use, uh, we can use star notation to unpack that struct into the name tuple. And we keep our names here. So, so the, the name tuple gives us back that, that freedom that we had in C to actually index into the data structure and use the names of the individual, individual attributes. Now, yeah, so as, as we're doing that, right, we can now access individual numbers, individual elements of the struct and say, well, print my name dot first, my name dot second, my name dot third, and see each one of those individually. The constructor for a named tuple is uh, again kind of weird. So you've got you, you say collections on name tuple. You you have to say the name of the type, and typically that needs to be the same as the name of the class that you're creating. And then you've got this this space delimited string for the field names. It could also be a list, but uh, most frequently for the collections on name tuple, I see I see that space delimited string. And what that does is it creates a subtype of tuple named whatever you call your type name. It inherits all of the methods that you have on tuple. So anything you can do with tuple, you can do with a named tuple. And then it gives that named attribute access to the fields in the tuple. But it's still a tuple. It's still immutable, like tuples are. It has the same memory footprint. So there's no there's no dunder dict attribute underlying the uh, underlying the object. And it compares equally to a tuple. So taking a look at each one of these, uh, here's a basic name tuple called name. We got first and last. I can create one for me and pass it my my first name, my last name. If I print it, I get a nice wrapper, uh, much nicer than if I got you know, just a tuple. So it shows me what the first name is, what the last name is. Uh, if I alternatively just create a regular old tuple, my names, well, I, I don't get those names. But if I compare the two together, I say, well, me as a name tuple versus me as just a tuple, those actually compare to being the same thing. Uh, which, is a, which is a nice feature because you're not losing anything when you when you cast from a tuple to a name tuple. You also have the the ability to add default values, and again the syntax kind of gets a little funky here. If we say, well, name's going to be a name tuple, and we're going to add a middle name optionally after the first and the last, and by default, if that middle name's not provided, we're going to say it's it's X. And now if I instant instantiate a name tuple for myself and I leave the middle name off. Then I'm going to get an uh, I'm going to get a name tuple. It's going to include the middle name, but the middle name is just going to be X. And it's worth digging into 
how exactly you need to you need to declare these things. So consider if we have a, a student named tuple, and the student has four attributes: a name, an ID number, an age, and then a year in school. And if we define two defaults, ten and five, well, what's going to happen here is we have four potential fields and then two named defaults. Those defaults, because anything that's not provided has to come after in Python, just using the syntax of a of a of an initializer has to come at the end of the things that, that don't have defaults. So they're going to get tacked on here onto the last two fields. So if I instantiate, instantiate a student named tuple without providing the age or the year, then I'm going to get the age and the year provided by this 10 and the 5. They'll only correspond to those two. If I didn't provide a name, well, then I wouldn't have a valid name tuple. So, uh, another feature of the, the name tuple is the ability to uh, create a dict. You can you can generate a dictionary comprehension or a dictionary representation of a name tuple using the underscore as dict method. So if I just uh, create this Tommy name tuple and then I call the underscore as dict method, then I'm going to get an ordered dict uh, of of all of Tommy's attributes and all of their values. And finally. The, the name tuple, just like the tuple, is still immutable. So I can access the, the Tommy age attribute. But if I want to say, okay, well, Tommy.age, rather than being 10, I, I'm going to make it be 11. Well, that's going to throw me an attribute error. And the reason is, again, tuples are immutable. They're actually immutable at the C level of implementation. So as an alternative for attribute modification, we have, the, we have a method underscore replace that lets us go in and generate a new name tuple uh, with some modified value. So if I actually did want to say, okay, well, well, well Tommy's not 10 anymore, Tommy's 11, then I can generate a new name tuple, Tommy plus one, where I call the underscore replace method and I say assign the value 11 to Tommy's age. And then I can see, well, in the Tommy plus one name tuple, Tommy's going to be 11. Uh, but in, in the original Tommy tuple, this, is, this can't change. It'll always be the same. Now, Looking at the name tuple, it's an improvement over a regular old tuple, and it, it gives us that that key feature of being able to reach in and store attributes on the structure. But what about types? So if, if you want to assign a type to name, for instance, you, you really can't. You can't say, well, name is expected to be a string. For that, you've got another uh, option, uh, another implementation of the name tuple in the typing module. So the same same object, the same same feature in the language, just in two different modules. This one uh, is in is in typing. So that was introduced in Python three point six, maybe three or four years ago. It provides a structural subclass, an actual like inherited subclass of tuple with typed fields, and it introduces this class based declaration syntax. Uh, that syntax is optional. So just like your collections name tuple, you can you have a one-liner declaration where now instead of using this this string, you can actually pass a uh, a list of tuples where the first element is the name of the of the field in the name tuple. The second element is the type, and then you're going to get type annotations on each of these fields. But that's that, that's again kind of a weird syntax, a weird declaration syntax, and so it's a lot nicer to use uh, a subclass. So just like you would for any other structural subclass you're going to create, if you import name tuple from typing, you could just subclass it, declare a class. You don't have to define an init method. You don't need to mess it with self at all. You just say, okay, well here are the attributes, here are their types, and then you've got the exact same uh, the exact same structure, but it's a lot cleaner and easier to read. Uh, and also now, if you want to add default values, uh, the default values before were kind of confusing. We had to we had to figure out where they're going to map onto the unpacked uh, fields. So now, for if you're using the class inheritance syntax, it's a it's a lot easier to read. You just say, okay, well, age default equals ten, year default equals five. That is a is a whole different degree of sanity as as compared to the collections.name tuple implementation. And finally, if we want to compare with a tuple, we say, okay, well, uh, Tommy's going to be a student. Tommy's got uh, name Tommy, ID 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, age is 10. He's in the fifth year in school. That's going to compare exactly equivalent to just a regular old tuple. Now, this is a nice feature, but it's kind of a double-edged sword if you're comparing a, a name tuple, which is this class that you define where each of the 
each of the values of the tuple has a, a meaning. And to just illustrate that example, if we, we had another name tuple that we call it a car, where the colors the car's got a color, it's got a vehicle identification number, it's got some number of wheels and some number of tonnage. And we've got Ginger, who's a person, and then a, a pickup who which has the color of Ginger, but all of these values are the same. The ID matches the, the VIN, the age matches the number of wheels, the year matches the number of tons. Well, in those two, even though they're different classes, you know, right, they're different types of name tuples, are also going to compare equivalent. So it's nice to be able to compare with a regular tuple value until it isn't, because you know here it, there's there are very little applications where you would actually want uh, a, a student to compare equivalent to a car. And lastly, just like we had in the collections.name tuple, we have immutability on the on the attributes in the typing name tuple. So if we try to say, well, Tommy's age is 11, we'll get this can't set attribute attribute error. So when, when would you use named tuples over a regular tuple? Uh, anytime I would, I'd say you want to add structure to processed immutable records, if you want to give descriptive names in compound data types, and to get rid of those magic index numbers. I think a lot of times when you're refactoring code, you can see, uh, well, we're going to take this tuple and just the third element out of it. We're going to pass that along to some, some downstream function. You can really improve that by assigning names that are descriptive and, and conveying to anyone who's reading the code what actually the third element of the tuple means. Now, when would you use typing name tuple over collections.name tuple? I'd say here basically all the time. I think I think typing that name tuple is Pareto dominant over collections name tuple. And if not all the time, I'd say at least when you're working in a typed code base. And also please work in typed code bases. Now if we're moving, if we're just saying, well, what other representations of structs are there? And there are actually a lot of them in Python. And the objective of this talk is to give kind of a survey of what the different options are and what the different use cases might be. Exiting tuple land, um, the next obvious choice is a data class. Data classes were introduced in Python 3.7 uh, about two years ago. They're, they're, they offer a shorthand for creating lightweight classes, and they create independent types, they're actually full Python objects with no relation to tuple. There's no inheritance going on. To give you an example of a data class, we can say from data classes module, import the data class. Uh, and then use that as a decorator on some regular class definition. And you'll notice this looks actually identical to the typing.name tuple. The only thing we changed was we're not inheriting anything, and we're just we're using a decorator to say this thing's a data class. And if we initialize one, we get the same default values. Tommy's going to get age of 10, year is 5. And uh, one difference from the, the typing name tuple is that we're not immutable anymore. So if I want to say, well, Tommy.age, uh, increment by one, well, I, I, Tommy's age is now going to be 11, and I'm not going to get an attribute error, which, depend, again, depending on your use case, maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's not. Uh, conversely, I can't now index into any of the attributes that, that are stored on the student. I think my, my puppy saw someone at the door. Uh, so, so unlike the 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 raw tuple, I can't just say give me the third element on Tommy. You can only access them by by name. So, if I try this, I'll get a type error and say student objects is not subscriptable. So, just to recap, a data class is mutable by default. It's not subscriptable, and they are just plain Python classes. And because they're just plain Python classes, you can you can tag on a method here. So I can say on student, rather than accessing the attributes directly, we could declare a birthday method and say, if you call birthday on student, then age is going to increment by one. And we can just call Tommy.birthday rather than adding one to his age and get that same age equal 11. Comparing with a tuple it doesn't work at all because right? we, we don't have that same inheritance from tuple that we got with the name tuple. So if we declare Tommy here and then compare him to uh, a tuple with the same attributes, that's now going to compare to false. However, if we wanted that that to be the case, we wanted that that comparison, then we could say uh, call data classes dot as tuple function on Tommy, and that's going to get a tuple representation of of the value stored on Tommy, and that will compare to true. 
you can't emulate immutability with a data class. Uh, I, I'll get to in a second why I say it's it's emulating. But if you declare a data class and say frozen equals true, uh, then that's going to throw an attribute error anytime you try to access or, or modify one of the attributes on the on the object. So here's uh, a frozen point. I'll say well, the origin is at point zero zero. And I say origin not x plus equal one. That's going to throw me a frozen instance error. It's going to say you can't assign to field x. The reason that it's only emulating, it's not actually uh, immutable, is that this is a full Python object. So there is this dunder dict attribute. And if I go in and say, well, origin uh, dunder dict element x doesn't equal zero, it equals one, then even though the data class is immutable, or it's supposed to be immutable, it's frozen, uh, I'm still going to be able to, to access that attribute. And that's not the case for a name tuple. So a data class is a Python object, and all Python objects have this dict attribute, uh, which, which stores the attributes on the, the object, whereas a tuple is a C artifact. So at the C level, the, the tuple is an immutable structure itself. So, so there is true immutability for a tuple, not for a data class. So I say, if you what you want is a simple tuple, then you should use typing.name tuple. And if what you want is a Python object that can grow in complexity, you should use a data class. Um, I find myself more frequently using data classes than name tuples, uh, partially because I, I find that really rarely can I can I specify in advance what the the entire use case of one of these objects is going to be. Oftentimes, I'll want to add some functionality in the data class just because it's re a regular Python class supports that. One of the nicest features of the data class is this dunder post init method. So if I if I create a data class, uh, say I'm still working with point, and I want to say, well, I've got x and y, and I also want to want to say, well, there's, there's a potential magnitude on the point, which would be the the distance from the origin of of some vector that would use the that, that would that would go from the origin to the point. And if I say init equal false on the the field of that of that attribute then I can use this post init method and say, well, after we run the init, after you initialize this point, then actually set magnitude to be the square root of x squared plus y squared. Now, I, I can create a point with x and y of 3 and 4. And then whenever I initialize that, that point, <clears throat> it's automatically going to calculate and store this magnitude attribute. So I get 3, 4, and magnitude equal 5 all on this class. Uh, for free without having to specify or say that it has to be calculated. If you want to learn more about data classes, I would really recommend Raven Hedinger's uh, The Code Generator to End All Code Generators talk from PyCon 2018. It's uh, it, He goes into much further detail than I do, and I, I think it's the best resource that I've, I've found. So moving on, uh, there's, the, there's also in the standard library the typed dict. Uh, it, not a whole lot to say about the type dict. It came out last year in, in Python 3.8. It adds type hints to the dictionary object. It, it doesn't define a new runtime class. At the runtime, the, the class is still going to be a dict, it, but it's really useful for type checkers like MyPy. So an example of usage, it looks a lot like the name tuple. So to declare a new type dict, you say, you, you declare a class, you inherit from type dict, uh, use the same syntax to say, here, here are the attributes, here are the types, and say, if I wanted to, to create Tommy, by print Tommy, I just get a regular dictionary, and I can even assert that the Tommy is of instance. It is an instance of the dict. When would you use type dict? I'd say uh, when you're processing dictionaries. So, for example, in JSON, it's it's nice to be able to add a little bit more structure and and typing to support something like like a MyPy type checker. And if you want to just add more structure to your regular dict type annotations, type dict is a good choice. So moving away from the standard library, there are two other options that I want to talk about. I know I'm short on time. Uh, first is adders. So adders is a, a third-party library with a model classes without boilerplate. So it's lightweight syntax for declaring custom types. It's been around since Python 2. And adders actually inspired and consulted on the data classes module. So as an example of adder usage, I can say, well, import adder, it got the same, it looks familiar from data class. You, you use a decorator to declare a, a new adder. And, and rather than directly saying the type of something, I, I use this adder.id syntax. And here I can create the origin point. Uh, but a big feature that, that, that adders has over data classes is the idea of validators. So uh, I, can, I can, in an adder class, 
I could say, well, create a validator on these two attributes. And if the value is going to be less than zero, then raise a value error and say, well, this is actually a first quadrant point and the coordinates have to be positive. So now if I say origin is a first quadrant point zero, zero, it's going to throw me that value error saying coordinates must be positive. More features over data classes. Uh, it's got Python 2 and PyPy support, validators, uh, converters. Uh, it has really nice syntax for, for using the Dunder slots attribute on classes. Which is, which is nice if you want to have higher performance memory usage. Uh, in a hand handwritten class, Dunder slots is kind of a pain to work around, and, and adders makes that really easy. And, and of course, there are more. Uh, it's been around for a long time. When would you use adders? I'd say when you need to support Python 2, and I have a little frowny face. I'd say when you need more advanced features than data classes can provide, and when you want to be on the absolute bleeding edge of functionality. Now, I, I'll pause here because I know we're at 4.30 and, and I had some technical difficulties. So, so let me know if I need to cut it here. OK, well, I'm, I'm going to keep going then. Uh, I have one more third party implementation of this kind of struct idea in Python. It's uh, a newer library called Pydantic. I'll give you an example of Pydantic. Uh, the way you use it, you'd import this base model, and then you can subclass base model for, like, for example, your point declaration, where you've got uh, an x as an int. You use the actual type annotation to say what it is. It looks a lot like a regular data class, and then you can you can create a new point. But it also includes this idea of validators. So, uh, sort of similar to adders, you can you can declare a validator as a as a decorator, and it can be any function. So it would be a class method, and you say must be positive. Again, we're still saying first quadrant x and y both have to be greater than zero. And if you if they aren't, if you provide like here x equals zero, then you're going to get a must be positive type equal value error. So Pydantic is a recent project. It takes advantage of of Python 3.6 type annotations as a, a first class design citizen. It provides strong support for data validation, and it actually it has a full data classes API. That they that they emulated, so you can. Uh, I'll show this. Rather than importing data classes, importing from the data classes module, you can import data class from Pydantic and use that as your as your class decorator. And rather than creating a data class, you create a Pydantic class. Uh, so here, I, I created a data class for pajamas. So I can say pajamas is a conference whose name is pajamas twenty twenty. The time is start time for this talk. And notice I, I type annotate time to be a date time. Uh, type, and then I pass it a string, like an ISO compliant uh, date string, and Pydantic is going to automatically convert that string. It's going to read it into and cast it as a date as a Python date time, uh, just because of that type annotation that I provided it. Uh, last feature that that Pydantic gives that I, I I've really become a fan of is uh, serialization unpacking. So if I, I added uh, this attribute on the conference class, say it's, it's got a set of presentations, which is a list of presentation objects themselves are Pydantic data classes, just the name and a title, then I can put my name in, in the title of my talk along with maybe another name and, and title of their talk. And if I want to uh, deserialize this thing, I say, okay, well, here's, here's the whole thing serializes just a, a dictionary with regular strings. Well, I can I can deserialize it using star star notation and get uh, it, it, and it's going to initialize the conference object from this outer dictionary and then the presentation object for these inner dictionaries and then I can index into them I can say okay well, what's the title attribute of the first presentation in the presentations list and it's actually going to give me this, this my talk uh, what the struct when would you use Pydantic uh, I, I use it when you need powerful data validation. Use it when you're validating external data through an API, where you do have to do the serialization, like you might in JSON, and you want to get those those compound data structures. And lastly, if you're in a typed code base. So a brief recap: what we talked about here, uh, we talked about C structs, we talked about Python structs, and how they can talk to C structs. We talked about the collection not name tuple and the typing not name tuple. Uh, we talked about data classes, typing not type dict, the adders library, and Pydantic. And looking at that list, it should recall from the Zen of Python, there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. I don't think that's the case for structural record types in Python, but uh, each of them have their own 
own strengths and weaknesses. And I, I hope that I was able to give you uh, some background of, of how we got where we are today and, and what might be applicable for your use cases. All right, so that is the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach. That was a really cool walkthrough, yes, of the standard library structure. Thank you so much. Uh, sure. Cool. And how are you enjoying the conference so far? Oh, it's been a blast. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm grateful. I mean, I, obviously, Pyjama has been uh, has been remote for a while, but I'm, I'm grateful that we have these remote conference opportunities because, like I said, I uh, I'm a new dad, so I, being able to stay home is really nice and still engage with with the community. Cool. Well, thank you very much for showing up, and thank you very much for a great talk as well. Uh, yeah, thank you. Sorry for the technical difficulties. It's all right. It happens. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. And we are now going straight for the next talk. We're a few minutes late, um, but we have now Daniel Lindemann with, who did I lend that book to? Uh, just one second. All right, so um, this is who did I lend that book to? Hard questions answered with Python. Um, my name is Dan Lindemann. I am a software engineer, senior software engineer at Very. Um, so Very, Very is an IoT consultancy. Um, so they're sort of the ones to blame for all of the kit behind me over here. Um, and uh, if you want to follow me on social, I am that handle on Twitter and that one on GitHub. Um, yeah. So um, when I work on a talk, I always have to make some assumptions about you. Um, and, and so if you are coming to this talk, I imagine you probably like libraries, both the Python kind and also the kind with books. Um, but you might also be somebody who's kind of got an unused Raspberry Pi uh, or just kind of a fledgling interest in IoT, um, and you're kind of looking for some inspiration. So. Um, if that's you, then you definitely found the right talk. Um, so you're in good company. All right. All right. So um, where are we going to go to today? Um, if you want to follow along with any of the code, um, the GitHub link is on the top of the screen here. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, the the hardware that goes into an Internet of Things project. So at the end of the day. This is an IoT project, right? Internet of Things. So first, to look at the thing, um, and we'll learn what all of these words are um, in just a little bit. Um, and we're going to get the hardware ready to do kind of an actual application project. Um, and so for this talk, I owe a whole lot to this Plat My Life article, which we'll reference several times, and I'll make sure that I have those um, in the slides here. Um, but after we look at the hardware setup, then we're going to pop to the um, internet level. Um, so we're going to look at Flask, um, set up a Flask server, and then like a little bit of JavaScript. And um, yeah, we'll just have to see how there's a, like what implications change when we're um, developing an IoT app um, and how that might affect the web server. So why even bother giving this talk? Um, what do I want to share? Well, so I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and, and um, I love going to my local library. Um, if you've never been to a city before, um, I highly recommend going and checking out their library. It's usually one of the coolest buildings in town. Um, and for Grand Rapids, that's no exception. Um, so, you know, the front half of it is this big, ornate looking historical building. You know, you walk in, it's got like marble floors and like big wooden staircases flanking either side of you. Um, but, the, but the back is actually this nice modern cylindrical building that has all the stacks in it. Um, so I really, really like it, and I figure if um, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, then um, you know maybe I could try my hand at, at developing a library application. So I was inspired because the checkout process changed significantly from when I was a kid. So when I was growing up, um, there was a little card in the back of the books, and you would have to like write your name and the date and like some other. Uh, information and now I feel old. Uh, but in uh, 
in modern times, what you do is you grab all your books and there's a little pad and you set it on top of it and you log into a computer, boop, boop, boop. It sees all of your uh, books immediately. You say, yes, I want to check those out and you're on your way. Um, it's magical. It makes everything really, really, um, I don't know, kind of easy to do and it makes you feel like just great about checking out a bunch of stuff. So um, because I'm a technologist though, I started to like wonder how that was implemented. And so I started looking in the back of every book and I saw these like giant stickers, right? Uh, it turns out this book, or every book now has an RFID tag in it. And um, we'll go into what RFID tags are in just a second. Um, but that's that's the mechanism by which these, these um, books can be scanned into the uh, library's database and handle check-ins and checkouts. Um, so the other motivation was because I was trying to build an Elixir application um, and I found myself reaching to Python a lot more, more often um, than I was for Elixir. I'm quite a bit better at Elixir now and so I feel a little bit more comfortable kind of exploring uh, in that way. Um, but I was going to work on an IoT tiddlywinks game uh, and yeah, I just found this Py My Life article, which uses Python, um, and I validated my entire hardware setup with Python because I'm still just a little bit faster with Python. It's my first language, um, but I just thought it was worth mentioning um, that, you know, even though I was intending to do an Elixir application, um, Python was still very, very helpful in the development process. So if we are ready to go, um, let's take a look at the thing level. So um, on the thing level, we're going to be using a Raspberry Pi. Um, I think most people already know what it is. Got one kind of handy over here as well. Um, they're about the size of a credit card. Um, if you don't know what it is, it's a very small computer that can run Linux. Um, it's really fantastic for making, uh, for learning and also for making kind of small IoT applications, um, you know, handcrafted artisanal um, one-offs. So at Very, we use these a lot for prototyping and, and for um, kind of figuring out what can and will work and, and during development. Um, so it has all like the nice things that you might expect uh, on a full system. Um, it has a lot more peripherals than most of the things we wind up developing, but um, it's there. So when you uh, get started with a Raspberry Pi, one of the main distributions of Linux that you use is something called Raspbian. Uh, so Raspbian is basically Debian or Debian Linux, um, but flavored to um, the Raspberry Pi. And as soon as you boot it up, you, you can actually start a terminal and type Python and boom, you're there. Um, so this is like one of many and Python is there to help slides. Um, but it's worth calling out. The Raspbian uh, uh, image has other languages uh, installed by default, um, but they're not all quite as pleasant to work with as Python. So we can see this is running Python 5.3.5, which is what comes with uh, Raspbian, or at least it did when I was working on this application. Um, I prefer later Pythons. Uh, 3.9 is lovely, um, but you know, just it's already there. It's out of the box, batteries included. So that, that's pretty cool. All right, so before we get into this, um, what is RFID? So RFID has a lot of uses and it's not really that hard to invent one. Basically, like if you have a thing and you have an ID and you want to tie those things together, you're going to use RFID. Um, it allows for contactless information passing um, using radio waves. So um, there are several kinds of RFID and they all have different characteristics. Um, the one we're gonna be using today is passive. Um, so they're basically used everywhere. I've talked about it in the library checkout process. Um, I'm a big Nintendo fan, so they're all in the Amiibos. Um, a lot of people here probably used to use access cards to get into their buildings, um, or if you went to the fire festival, um, you know, that's also RFID. So they can also store a little bit of data. Um, we don't, really use that so much here. Um, I know that Amiibo do store off a good amount of data um, for game saves and, and progress of things, but um, we use it a little bit here, but not 
that uh, it's not kind of like the main main feature. So the main reason RFID is a useful technology is because of how long passive tags last, uh, which is forever. Um, the power all comes from the reader, right? So there is no power in any of these little tags that I bought. Um, they don't have a battery in them anywhere. Um, they're just powered by the radio waves coming from the reader. So they also fit into a tiny form factor. I just showed you an entire set of stickers. So this is 10 RFID tags, uh, I think. Yes, 10. Um, and you can put them basically everywhere, right? Um, anywhere you can fit a sticker, you can tag something. So that's why they're in like key cards, you can fit in your wallet. Um, you know, there are also um, active ones. Active RFID, however, requires a power source. So a common application for that is for like cattle tracking. Um, the nice thing about those is that their range is substantially larger. Um, but again, for context of this talk, um, we're talking about passive RFID. So when you're considering the characteristics, power, we don't need to power it up. Data, it can store data, not a ton, but it can actually store some. Uh, and the size of it, those are the three like really big um, boons to why uh, you know, you're interested in RFID. Cool, so before you get anywhere, um, you're gonna actually have to buy things. Um, so uh, a little aside uh, that I like to kind of mention here is that I think that the Raspberry Pi gets the reputation for being very accessible. Um, and it certainly is, right? It's $35 for a computer. Um, but there's sort of little hidden accessibility issues with it, which are, you know, you need an SD card, uh, reader and writer. You need another computer unless you buy like a pre-baked image that can write those SD cards. Um, you, if you're going to do like a traditional like uh, desktop setup, you need a display, cables, a power jack, um, a mouse and a keyboard. So even though it is a $35 computer, by the time you get all that kind of pieced together, um, it starts to be a little bit less accessible and a, a less affordable than you might originally think. I mean, it's still a lot better than a full blown desktop or a laptop environment, um, but anyways. So with that aside, um, here are some Amazon links to what I bought. Um, you can see that Amazon is it's not an amazing place to buy stuff from. I highly recommend not pur purchasing from Amazon. Um, for the purposes of these supplies, um, I was able to, I knew the manufacturers and the boxes and that looked like the right thing. And so I was able to kind of like um, make the call here that this, this would be okay to buy from Amazon. So you can even see the, the lower one calls out the Arduino Raspberry Pi, um, which is not a thing that exists. Um, because it's either an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. So the only thing I was really, really looking for here was compatibility between the frequency of, of the tags and the reader. So here I'm using the 13.56 megahertz. Um, and so the tags and the reader all, all do that. Um, so now I, I did talk about, about how, you know, Raspberry Pis aren't as accessible as we think. Um, but all in all, even though um, these prices are a little bit different. I was able to purchase all of this kit for a little over $10. Um, and keep in mind that I bought two readers and 50 tags. Um, most people won't need to buy that many, but I was planning to tag up my entire um, library back here. Um, so I needed a couple more. Um, cool. So if you do, do purchase things from Amazon, I highly recommend getting used to their return process. Cool. So this is the wiring schematic from Pi Up My Life. Um, and I don't think this is very easy to read visually. Um, actually, in my notes, my speaker notes, I have, I have good luck if you're colorblind written down um, because what are these different colors and how are they all crisscrossed? And I need like a, it looks like somebody tried to connect stuff with a, with a crayon, right? Um, it's still useful. And this is very, um, very much, you know, your breadboard, your RFID reader, and your Pi. But it's not quite so helpful um, to get started because we want to connect the Pi to this RFID reader. So I find this diagram a lot less confusing. So uh, the RFID reader 
speaks over a protocol called SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface, um, which is a GPIO related um, task. So the reason I find this really helpful is because in this diagram, we have you know, all the purple ones in the middle, uh, GPIO 10, 9, 11, um, are giving us all of the different um, connections we're going to need to use to speak from our Raspberry Pi to, to an SPI device, so the RFID reader. Um, the, the protocols for this are the unfortunately named master and slave uh, protocol. So we have MOSI, MISO, and S-Clock. Um, so MOSI is master out, slave in, so that's the Pi talking to the rear. Uh, and then we also have MISO, uh, which is not only a delicious thing to add to meals and soups, but it is the master in slave out. So that's the RFID reader talking back to us. Um, the clock exists so that um, the two different devices know when to talk to each other. Um, and yeah, those are those are the important ones. There's there are more connections, but that's going to give you basically the gist of it. You know, what kind of data are you sending and when are you sending it and in what direction? Um, but I think, um, you know, this is a lot easier to read even than that, right? All this little kind of part of the article requires that you know um, is which pin you're looking at and how to count pins, um, GPIO pins on your Raspberry Pi. Um, if you have a guide like the one I mentioned earlier, uh, do it. Uh, in IoT, you don't always get this. Um, so when you have it, one is spectacular. So in reality, once I've wired everything together, this is what it winds up looking like. Um, I just thought it was kind of important to show what it looks like in the wild because it's not very fancy or impressive. It's just a couple of wires um, stuck between boxes. Um, so the setup is connecting the SPI interface of my Raspberry Pi and then drawing power from the 3.3 volt out. Um, at this point in time, you're probably like, okay, so I've done all the connections. We're ready to go, right? Um, we're not. We have one more little step um, to tell the operating system to enable that SPI interface, because on Raspbian, it's not there by default. Um, in a framework like NERVS, this is on by default. Um, but we're using like a full-fledged OS like Raspbian. Um, it, it doesn't do that. So we have like one more step of setup. Um, this is not my favorite part of the talk, by the way. Um, I think this is just an important difference that came up when developing something with Python and, and Raspbian versus something like Elixir and NERVS. Um, in NERVS, those, all those low-level interfaces are already enabled for you. So you don't really have to manually do this. Um, this, this is another barrier to entry, I think, for a lot of people, because this is sort of Linux sysadmin sys as a blocker. Um, it's a little scarier. Um, it's not like the worst offender I've ever seen out there in the land of IoT tutorials, um, but it's certainly just one of the scarier parts of the tutorial. If you're just getting started, you know, enabling a um, interface and then rebooting your Pi is not going to seem like something natural. Great. So um, now we want to go implementing some code that actually sends and receives over SPI. So we're going to need to know the standards. We're going to need to look at some data sheets. We're going to worry about significant bits, endianness, all oh, much. So this is like the daunting part and sharp edges of developing uh, IoT solutions. There are a hundred sharp edges. Um, this is a lot more true in the world of Nerves and Elixir, um, and it's getting better every single day, but it's still very true. In Python, I found something that implemented the entire SPI interface for the registers of our RFID reader. So uh, in the span of about 20 minutes, um, I was reading and writing card data like a champ. Um, so that library was built on the hard work of dozens of people who aren't me. Um, and that's a lot better in my opinion. So uh, the library is called simple, or it's called MFRC522. So this RFID reader is the uh, RC522. So it's compatible with those. Um, so this is another example of where Python was just sort of there to help. Um, the Elixir land equivalent of this library is not as complete. 
Um, it has a lot of other cool things, um, but you know, Python and Pythonistas tend to make things very simple, very obvious, very um, available. So these two functions uh, on line seven and on line 13, reader.read and reader.write um, are gonna be the core of this entire application. Um, and I'm gonna use them pretty close to as is, but we're about to find out why I couldn't use them exactly like this. Um, but nonetheless, these two functions will allow you to start reading um, data from tags, getting the IDs and printing them to the console, um, or writing data onto the tags to store some information. Um, so now that we can read and write, um, where do we go? Well, adventure awaits. We've solved the thing layer, and it's time for us to move over to the internet level, um, which in our case is going to be a Flask server. I chose Flask because it's just the least boilerplate to look at to really understand what's going on. So this is the complete application that we're going to build. This is like my site. Menu. And they're going to be uh, built around those two functions, read and write. Um, so the top level node here, the index, is going to have three links that's going to go to register, lend, and my inventory. Um, so I'll quickly go over ind index and inventory um, because they don't really have any of the IoT goodness with it. Um, but inventory is actually the one that I care the most about. So the problem I was trying to solve was that I will um, buy a book and love it. And then as soon as I'm done with it, I want to lend it out to somebody. Um, so the net effect is my home library only ones up being like this big because I've lent out like 90% of my books to other people. Um, so I wanted to keep track of who had my books. So, you know, inspired by my own library and the need to figure out where my books are going. Um, the inventory page is the most useful for me. But again, it's not that interesting from an IoT perspective. So uh, this is the inventory page. Uh, we're using a SQLite database, and um, we're basically grabbing um, different books from the inventory and saying, you know, I can return them uh, or I can delete them if one of my friends decided that they were just going to keep the book and I don't get to have it anymore. Um, this is a pretty normal, um, you know, post endpoint for. Um, return or delete. It's just updating some fields in, in the database. Like I said, not terribly interesting from an IoT perspective, but still, it's there. Um, cool. So this is what it looks like. So here we see that I've lent out the room to my friend Jace, and I can either return the book, or if he decides he wants to keep it, um, then it'll delete it from the inventory. So it's showing the ID. Um, the data that's on the tag, and then who it is currently lent to. Awesome. So the first page that allows us to interact with the hardware um, has a bug. And I'm wondering if you can spot it. If not, um, recall that at the end of the day, we're trying to transfer some bytes. We're going to take a title. So the, the screen works something like this. You type the name of the book, you know, Gone with the Wind, and you hit Submit. And it's going to write Gone with the Wind to the next RFID tag that it sees. Um, it blocks. When, when you type that in and you click Submit, um, it just sits there in an empty screen and kind of shows nothing. Uh, it is a problem. Um, but since the I'm the person who is registering books, um, I could decide whether or not that that was like a problem for me. So let's take a look at a short movie here. Um, and uh, this is kind of what it looks like in motion. Cool. So you can see I've got the book Two Scoops of Django. And I'm going to submit that. And then you see it's just kind of like doing nothing, right? It's just spinning and the screen isn't changing. So then I take my two scoops, which has an RFID tag in it. And it's going to send us just automatically redirect back to there. So let's check in my inventory. Boom. There's two scoops of Django, and it is lent out um, to Nuba. Awesome. 
So again, I, um, you know, if we take a look at why that is, like what happened there, um, what's happening is that if we look inside the write function, we see a while loop, right? And so that's going to block, oops, I need to hide that. So if we look inside the write function, uh, it's a while loop. It's a literal, you know, while not ID. Um, and it's basically going to hold that forever. Uh, and what Flask is trying to do is Flask is trying to render the next thing, but this function call inside of it that's writing to the RFID tag is just holding it. So it can't actually render anything. So it just doesn't move at all. Um, there is a write no block function. Um, and I tried to work around this. Um, in general, you want to isolate your different uh, peripherals into their own processes. Um, but in Python land, that's not super easy. I was trying to work around this maybe using Redis and PubSub, um, which had its own problems. Um, there's probably an elegant way to do this with like um, async and yielding things. Um, but for the registration process, since I'm the one registering all the books, I was like, this isn't that bad. I type in my thing and I'm going to do one book at a time. I don't usually buy like 20 books at a time. So it was a possible workaround, um, and it was probably like the hardest thing to walk away from while I was um, making the like checkout screen, right? Um, so we're going to be talking about the actual like lending process in a second here. Um, something that I did learn was that Flask can actually render things piecewise from a generator, um, and I really wanted to get this right, um, but passing messages in Python between two processes um, is not as easy or as simple as one might think. And, um, you know, it's a little bit out of scope for this talk. Um, so we'll just kind of like talk about the different trade-offs. If you're interested in streaming, um, I really like the Palette Projects um, tutorial here. Um, so we knew we had this bug. Um, but it was closing in on when I wanted to kind of like wrap up this experiment, right? Because I'm ultimately working on something else. And all I'm trying to do here is just figure out, well, can I do it? Is there some cool stuff in Python? Um, so I decided to just write a slide about the bug and say that this is now just a feature um, and that it's designed that way because, well, I own the library. So, so what? So we will revisit this bug again. Um, and in write, it's not so bad. In read, however, it's a lot worse. So when uh, we want this application to loan out books, so how can we do that? Um, we think that there's like probably a right way to do this, um, but let's take a look at the implementation as it is. What's happening here is um, the read no block. It's pretty much like write no block. It'll let us pass by it. Um, so we can continue to do um, a little bit of work. So what I'm doing here is I've set a one second timeout for the RFID reader to kind of scan its surroundings and look for books. Um, that's not a very good user experience, right? Because in, in the public library, you know, they have maybe like a 15 centimeter scan uh, height for all the books. So you can set like a bunch on top. Um, but here, if I had to lend out more than one book, I'd have to scan them all like, like really quickly in, in one second. Um, but I do this for a reason. So what's going to happen here is we're going to um, give the RFID reader about a second um, to look for to look for the books that it sees, um, and then we're going to break out of that loop. And um, any scans that I've seen, we're going to add to a set called scans, um, and then that's what's going to get rendered on the Flask application. So even though we think there's a correct solution, um, we can actually do um, something a little bit easier. So the reader is going to have one second to look, but Flask isn't going to be able to um, render anything. In fact, this was the main problem. I was trying to click buttons in Flask, um, but it could never pull the context back because that while loop um, was sort of still taking over. Even though it was just one second, um, I noticed that I couldn't touch any of the Flask rendered pages. So um, what we can do here, we could either have done the async streaming stuff, or if we truly believe that simple is better than complex, we can add three lines of, of JavaScript to our 
uh, front end and have it refresh the page every quarter second. So essentially the feature we're getting here is a trade-off between the RFID reader reading and the Flask app being able to render something. And so I found that this was a, a reasonable way to get some feedback and allow me to click the buttons um, while still giving kind of like a responsive um, feel to lending things out. So here is uh, the lending process in action. So I'm going to click to lend books. Uh, and I've got my two scoops of Django. Click it to the RFID reader, and we see it go boom, pop up there. Two scoops of Django. Great. So now I'm done, and I want to figure out who I'm going to lend it to. So now I've lent two scoops of Django uh, to Jace. There we go. And we go back home. So in this instance, uh, JavaScript is there to help. Uh, I know that I was supposed to have a bunch of different slides that are, well, Python is there to help. And I know this is a Python conference. Um, but I think anytime um, you, know, you find a language that's there to help, um, be it Python or JavaScript, um, that's a really good thing. So um, I can't help but celebrate when I find that something is there to get me out of a bind. Um, so since the solution we came up with is serving a single client, me, and it's the only process running on the machine, um, it felt like a fair balance between correct and done. So lastly, this, this page is also taking that scans. Um, this is just kind of the second part of checkout process. Um, and we just kind of keep things in that scans cart, um, and then we assign them to somebody on the next screen. So this is just updating who um, the RFID scans are that we just found and just adding their um, loaned to field um, to the database so that we could go check it out in inventory. Um, and so that is it. That's the entire application. We did it. Um, I want to um, thank you for spending some time and attention with me. We only get so much per day. Um, and I can't tell you how much it means to me that you spent some of yours on me. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll be available and be around. And I want to give a special thanks to my friend Jace, who helped me um, put together a lot of this in Python land. Um, if you don't have any other questions, um, I had some hopefully asked questions, which are, what are your favorite books? Um, I really like everything is illuminated and designing data intensive applications. If you know those two books, um, this is a funny joke. If you don't, it's not. Um, so. Something that I would do differently next time um, is I'd probably do less coding on a Pi. Um, and I would probably actually do those separate services. Now that I've spent a lot of time in Elixir working with processes, um, I think it really is kind of the way to go. Um, I'd also add tests, a lot more tests, um, because right now, um, during the development of this application, there were quite a few guesses being taken. So. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Um, if you want any other sources, here are all the things that I had to look at um, during, during my time developing this application. So thanks. Cool. So thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, if anyone wants to catch up with Daniel, uh, he's on the chat. And he's also on Discord, Python and Pyjamas Discord. Uh, cool. So next now we have Rinaldi. Uh, hello. 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 Welcome. Welcome to Pyjamas. How are you? Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm doing great. How about you? Good. Very, very good. Where are you streaming from? I'm currently streaming from Melbourne in Australia. Melbourne. That's so awesome. I'm currently in Dublin, Ireland. So. Oh, okay. Quite some time away. <laughs> yes, just a little bit. What time is it for you now? All right. Now it's uh, 9 a.m. in the morning. 9 a.m. Okay. Now, well, here it's 10 p.m. Ah, so. okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I will let, it, let you take this, the, the stage then. So you're going to talk to us today about cryptocurrency, right? Yep, that's right. Wonderful. 
So, well, thank you. Uh, let's add the slides and remove my. Cool. So, again, hello everyone. I'm Rinaldi, and I'm going to be giving my talk cryptocurrency, ledgers, and Python. Oh my. So, without further ado, we'll just dive straight into it. So, I'm going to be telling a bit about myself as well first. So, I'm a founder and developer advocate at Gray Studio. I'm certified in AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. My personal field of interest is within security and accessibility practices. And it falls in line as well with blockchain because I always try to strive to develop blockchain applications that can really be called secure and can really be kept, uh, the integrity of it can be kept uh, intact essentially. And also on the side, I have a few hobbies as well, such as uh, running some meetups, uh, running hackathons, doing tech talks. I've been um, doing tech talks, uh, sharing my best practices and about many other topics in many other fields uh, for the past four to five years now. And on the side, I also am a huge VR tech enthusiast as well, playing with new VR technology, seeing where uh, development goes, and also just experimenting with uh, the apps and developments that come out with uh, VR technology in general. So here's the agenda for our talk today. First, I'm gonna to be talking about the motivation developing blockchain, as of course, we need to be able to get a motivation first, such as why do you wanna use Python for developing blockchain technology and such? And after that, I'm gonna be talking about benefits of using Python with uh, blockchain technology. Steps of uh, to being able to create blockchain is next. Fourth, uh, simple mistakes that you can avoid to be when developing blockchain applications. Fifth, the potential for creating bigger apps. Essentially, in this case, I'll be talking about how you're able to apply it to bigger case scenarios. Since in this particular case study, I'll be just showing a development of a very simple ledger cryptocurrency based application that you can make yourself. And finally, we're going to be wrapping up. So, Firstly, what is the motivation developing blockchain? So blockchain has been getting increasingly popular at this time, especially during this time due to the current pandemic situation that we have been going through. Even before it was already popular, we have already seen it uh, being applied by the big companies to create uh, many different applications such as smart contracts, uh, creating a uh, building based on Hyperledger and many other applications. But we have seen it grown even more now because in this current uh, era where we currently are working from home uh, due to the COVID-19 restrictions, we've seen more and more people start to adopt a more distributed systems approach to everything. We've been seeing more people adopt a ledger-based approach and it has become more important than ever now to be able to understand how the whole development system process in blockchain, uh, blockchain and for example, Python works and being able to understand better how we're able to develop apps based on it. So aside from that, we also, if you're already familiar with blockchain, then you know that one of its biggest and most important properties is that records cannot be altered. And that is one of the most important things as well when we talk about uh, developing blockchain applications, we need to be able to ensure that the integrity is maintained. And that is one of the benefits as well that because it essentially functions as its own record management system. You can't alter it from outside, and that's one of the best advantages of it. And finally, it provides an easy way of providing transactions, and it also lets you keep control of the records easily from the central uh, system. So it eas easily makes up for, uh, it easily constitutes a very coherent and integrity-based uh, integrity system for uh, providing a distributed and decentralized system for uh, tracking cryptocurrency. And benefits of using Python with blockchain technology. So first off, it's simple and reliable. It's very easy to start off as I'll demonstrate as well through this, uh, these, uh, this particular talk. And it's very reliable as I mentioned before because it essentially serves as a proof of work which I'll discuss as well in the next few slides. 
It helps you to be able to keep track of everything from a centralized location. It allows you to add query lists without the need for parallel transactions, which is a very important property as well that we need from uh, blockchain technology. It provides us, uh, uh, Python provides us with ready to use blockchain libraries. And this falls in line as well with the fact that it is there's a very active open source community for blockchain. Throughout my development process with blockchain, throughout my experimenting process of trying to develop uh, interesting side projects and also for the use of uh, my own purposes as well within my organization, uh, I've already been so uh, engaged with uh, being able to just see how active the community really is and really seeing the all the libraries already provided by the community, helping to also already build on applications. And this includes also open source libraries such as Hyperledger, for example. It's, it's really great to see that the community is really active and that also makes developing uh, much easier within Python because we are able to use those open source libraries and uh, the community is still very active with uh, questions that are uh, regarding blockchain. So it's really helpful when uh, starting out with blockchain. And definitely when we start out of a journey, such uh, kind of uh, an optimism and an engagement is necessary for us to really understand uh, well uh, what we need to be able to do uh, with blockchain. And of course, major blockchain uh, platforms uh, right now, such as Ethereum, currently already are based on Python. So it really does provide a proof of concept that it really does work with, uh, well with uh, blockchain when the big ones, such as uh, Ethereum, use it as well. So when we talk about steps to the blockchain, there are quite a few steps. So in this particular uh, example, I'll be de demonstrating on how to be able to build a particular blockchain system based on a hypothetical cryptocurrency. So we will be going to a few steps. So this, the first step will be understanding how mining works first. It's very important to be able to understand how it works first. I'll not be going too in, in depth into the concept of how mining works because I don't intend this to be uh, kind of like a tutorial on how uh, mining or blockchain works, uh, but rather have this as a highlight on how blockchain is applied to Python, because I'm aware that there are a lot of uh, sources and references online to already check out how mining and blockchain or cryptocurrency uh, works in general. And afterwards, we have to define a block alongside the concept of a transaction so essentially, we, we need to con we need to be able to convey what what do we would want to define as a block and what is a transaction in our particular case scenario. That those are the important elements that we need to define while we start our code uh, and developing our particular blockchain system. We then want to build the blockchain system. Afterwards, we then define a way to add new blocks through the mining process, and this will be also shown. Uh, in the next couple of slides as well. And finally, how do we are able to use our REST API to be able to create the mining process, to be able to simulate and test the mining process. So first off, I'm just going to be showing some code. In this particular case scenario, we define a block first. So as you can see, we defined quite a few properties here to start off with. We define the index, the timestamp, uh, because these are these are all properties that need to be tracked within uh, each of the blocks. We need to be able to track what index the block is in and what what the particular time it is in, the transactions involved with it. Uh, we need to be able to track the previous hash that is involved with it. And hashing is a central part of uh, being able to develop within uh, blockchain. And I'll be also showing that in the next slide as well. And of course. Uh, identifying the nonce. And in this particular scenario, the nonce is uh, essentially it's a number added to the hashed or encrypted block. And essentially, when it is rehashed, it can meet the difficulty level restrictions. For those who are not too familiar with uh, difficulty level, I'll be explaining that as well as we go along the code. And in this particular case, nonce is the number essentially blockchain miners are solving for in order to create the proof of work. And as I mentioned before, we create a particular process to hash the blocks. So as you can see uh, in this particular scenario, we uh, have a function called compute hash. We essentially, uh, basically in this case, 
we return a particular hash based on SHA-256 uh, to be able to add code the particular uh, block string. Uh, and essentially, we then are able to encode it, and we're able to return that particular uh, encoding based on that particular uh, the SHA-256 uh, encryption standard. So afterwards, we then go into coding the blockchain itself. So when we go into this, we then start to see as well uh, how we're able to go along with uh, the start the coding of the whole blockchain. And in this particular scenario, we're essentially creating immu immutability by including hash of the previous block uh, within the current block. And we then create a particular system of awareness, shared awareness of data to be able to help establish the integrity of the chain. So as you can see over here, we define quite a few uh, parameters here, uh, unconfirmed transactions. And essentially, in this particular scenario, when we talk about unconfirmed transactions, we want to be able to start keeping track of which transactions we've already confirmed and which transactions we have not yet confirmed, because it is important. We need to be able to confirm transactions as we go along to be able to confirm that they do match the requir uh, requirements, uh, including the difficulty level standards, and also that it is valid as a block. We then also define the chain. We then define a particular uh, block. And in this case, I call it a magic coin block. And I just like to also give a disclaimer that I do not intend to uh, create any particular reference to any existing cryptocurrency. Because honestly, when I was uh, trying to select a particular name for a hypothetical coin, I was I think I searched about like a uh, five to 10 searches and every search I got, there was already coin with that name. And so far, Magic Coin didn't have that name. So I apologize in advance if it does exist, but I do not intend to actually reference a coin that does exist. So uh, with that in mind, we create uh, we then uh, particularly create a method for uh, creating a Magic Coin uh, block method uh, in this particular case. We th in this particular case, we define how it is captured essentially. We 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 assign a particular uh, we we assign a particular um, block. Uh, we assign the block uh, the particular uh, time, and we assign zeros to the front of it because that is essentially going to be the start of our proof of work algorithm, which I'll also talk about in the next few slides. And we then start hashing it. We then uh, by computing the hash as uh, evidenced by the previous method. We then start to append the particular uh, the block towards the chain that we've already defined. And this will uh, eventually be a continuous process. We'll continue uh, appending new blocks towards this cool chain. And essentially, it'll move on from unconfirmed transactions to then being confirmed and to the chain. So it's essentially be continuing to go in that, that direction. And of course, we then all, always want to be able to capture which is the last block. And that's why we also define a particular last block uh, and capture uh, the, the, the minus one index in that particular chain. And just an important note about hashing as well, SA, uh, SHA 256 is not the only way, uh, it's not the only hashing algorithm to, to do blockchain. There are possible other ways. It's just that SHA-256 is the most standard way. It's what Bitcoin uses, for example, and it's what other a lot of other cryptocurrencies have used. But it is not the only way. It's, it, it essentially already functions as a proof of work algorithm, which is why it is very popular uh, within the cryptocurrency community. So essentially, if you do want to try other hashing algorithms, it's definitely possible. It's just that SHA-256 is the most popular one that's currently used. And afterwards, we then start creating a proof of work algorithm. And in this algorithm, as you can see, we define a difficulty level. And at the difficulty level, essentially, uh, we essentially uh, show how much work uh, needs to be done, essentially, to be able to uh, establish a particular uh, wor work that uh, proof of work that uh, needs to be done. And essentially, in this particular uh, case, proof of work essentially a uh, consensus algorithm, which is uh, used in the blockchain network, which we then use to confirm transactions and produce new blocks to the chain. 
essentially in this case scenario, we need to be able to scan for a uh, value that uh, starts with a given number of uh, zero bits uh, when it is hashed. And this number of zero bits is going to be the difficulty. And it, it'll function as a zero knowledge proof to show between parties that uh, work has been done, which shows that uh, the mining has been done essentially to be able to prove that uh, we currently do possess that particular currency. So in this case scenario, we then compute the hash. Uh, we then, uh, as you can see, we then start to be able to uh, check if it, uh, that it does not yet uh, start with zero. And um, as, as mentioned before, it uh, zeros do represent the difficulty. And we then uh, multiply it by difficulty. And we then add uh, the nonce to it to be able to then check if the work uh, has been done. And afterwards, we return the computed hash as part of the proof of work. We then start adding and validating blocks. So in this particular scenario, we want to be able to store data of uh, each transaction into unconfirmed transactions and add it to the chain uh, after being able to confirm that the new block satisfies the difficulty criteria and thus being able to satisfy the need uh, for the proof. And uh, this is also where the mining itself begins within uh, blockchain. So we then start to be able to uh, add blocks towards the, uh, towards the, the system and uh, in this particular scenario, I called a particular chain a uh, system mine, and we then start to be able to uh, check the previous hash. We, we've used this last block method to be able to capture the last hash. We then start to be able to uh, then start to uh, check if the uh, use the using a validator, uh, which we define below as well. We do, we make a particular validator for the chain to be able to return. Uh, blockchain hash, uh, the block hash. We then uh, compute the particular hash we, we, to be able to uh, check that it does match the particular uh, hash according to the difficulty level as well that uh, has already been uh, determined from the beginning. We check if it does match it. And if it's not, valid, it's not, it's not uh, validated by the validator, we return a false. But else, we let it go through. And uh, we then essentially, uh, equal, uh, we then initialize the hash towards the uh, system by chain itself. So then we are able to then finally return true if it does, uh, if everything checks out, and then we add the block towards the chain if it all matches. And then we need to adjust the work needed to mine the blocks. In this particular case scenario, we start adding a new transaction. And as you can see, we start to also append the particular uh, firstly towards uh, unconfirmed transactions. As I mentioned before, we firstly go for it first. And towards the mine, we then also check if uh, we then check if it's already within uh, unconfirmed transactions. Uh, if it's not, we didn't return a false. We then also start to be able to initialize the last block to uh, well, last block itself uh, from the self method. Uh, and afterwards, we then initialize uh, a new block. We then create a particular new proof of work. Uh, this is essentially going to function as kind of like the main method of everything. We then um, go into adding a new block. We initialize the accurate access to zero again when we've already finished everything. And finally, we return the new block index. Afterwards, we then define the use of Flask to be able to test the blockchain uh, with a REST API. So in this particular instance, we can use Flask to be able to test, uh, create a REST, a REST API to be able to build that interface, uh, to be able to test multiple nodes to get them to interact with each other and eventually be able to test it out. So in this particular instance, we're calling the blockchain based on Flask. So essentially, uh, we'll be also connecting it with the next slide as well, which is essentially to be able to get the chain. So in this particular instance, we're essentially going to be able to root to be able to define our web application and create a local blockchain while being able to specify an endpoint which allows us to send a query to display uh, information we need about the blockchain. So we need to be able to do this by uh, essentially uh, firstly tracking the blockchain information that's already currently available. We go for uh, basically tracking the blocks that are in within the chain. We append the uh, chain data that is already uh, currently 
uh, within the blocks. And we then go into running the application uh, based on a specified uh, port number and also uh, setting the debug to true. And we can see the results in the next slide. And as we can see over here, when we run the particular uh, uh, blockchain that we've created, we will receive something similar to this. We, we will see something, uh, a timestamp such as this. We'll be able to uh, see a particular hash that's created based on it. We'll be able to see uh, length and also the hash, previous hash, and be able to see the nonce as well. And we will be able to keep track of uh, items such as this. And each time we run it, we'll be able to keep track of uh, the mining process and the blocks uh, through such a process such as this. And we'll be able to uh, really uh, create a continuous uh, mining um, application based on this particular case scenario. So some simple mistakes to avoid are firstly that the blockchain scales well. That is one of the most fatal mistakes to make in blockchain because blockchain essentially is something you need to plan beforehand as well. It's not something that can be scaled around easily. So it's something that needs to be kept in mind while uh, talk about blockchain. And of course, we have the misconception of interoperability. We need to be able to ensure that uh, intro, uh, because blockchain essentially, although it is a very popular thing, it is not a thing that is already interoperable with many applications. It's something that we need to also be keeping into mind. Not uh, it, It's supported by a lot of platforms, but not all platforms support, mind you. So it's something that needs to be kept in mind as well when we talk about uh, developing blockchain. Also, designing as a core complete business application is also a wrong thing to do because it is by no means a complete business application. It definitely helps to support business applications, but it is no way in a, as a standalone core business application on its own. So it always needs to be kept into mind as well if we are developing uh, blockchain applications. Not creating immutable, immutable uh, data audit trails is also a big uh, mistake as well uh, in blockchain. And also assuming that technology is mature because it is a continuously developing uh, technology. And of course, we have the potential for bigger applications as well. Being able to de design a new cryptocurrency with more classes, just a wallet, centralized uh, update system, and much more. And as I mentioned in the beginning as well, being able to uh, build on and utilize open source projects such as uh, Hyperledger. Uh, I know IBS, for example, uh, doing a lot of applications on Hyperledger, uh, developers are building on Hyperledger to be able to create blockchain for your own purposes as well and for research purposes. Uh, so it's really great to see uh, so many uh, companies are using it as well to be able to support their own systems and to be able to really create uh, smarter systems as well, just as smart contracts for their own applications and also uh, really build on uh, proof of work systems as well, which really do a lot of good in the companies. And also to be able to design and develop for supply chains is a big potential application. And we are able to create smart contracts, as I mentioned before, uh, make payments and provide proof of work systems for uh, supply chain management. And finally, wrapping up, we need to be able to experiment and see how it works in your projects. So essentially, it's something that uh, doesn't really come on overnight. Blockchain is something you have to play around first, get used to it, and really see how it works. Use it as a support system as in your projects. It's really a fun thing to experiment, especially with the active community. You're able to really uh, get a feel of how the community really embraces uh, blockchain and really also understand how it's uh, applied in a lot of projects. And do not assume that technology is already fully adaptable as a regular product because blockchain is a continually evolving uh, technology. By no means is it mature. It is going to be continually uh, being developed over time. And essentially, we'll continue seeing developments and new fixes to it. And we'll be seeing a lot of ups and downs as well. So it's all going to be about the following the journey as well, about how how the project goes. And also, adapt an agile culture to be able to quickly evaluate and perform every step. Because, uh, because uh, blockchain is a very volatile, um, should I say, uh, technology, we'll be able to see a lot of uh, changes to it rapidly as well. So because of this, we need to be able to quickly adapt and evaluate performances uh, quickly. And due to this, we'll need to be able to uh, quickly uh, evaluate accordingly based on each step and make decisions when we decide to use blockchain in our particular systems. So an agile culture really helps out this, with this because we are able, able to evaluate uh, in each step because it's an agile culture. We'll be able to keep track 
of how it goes in each step and make uh, decisions accordingly uh, when we do see fit. So uh, that's all for me. Uh, thank you again for uh, listening to my talk. I'm really happy to be here today to share uh, my knowledge about uh, developing blockchain applications, albeit it's a, quite a simple one, but I'm definitely sure that it'll be able to help you uh, go into developing bigger applications for your business or side projects. And I'm happy to also, uh, if there are any post caught first questions, I'm happy to take any on um, Twitter or my uh, LinkedIn as I put there. And again, uh, thank you as well. And thank you as well to all the conference organizers for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. That was awesome. Yes, I learned a lot about Hyperledger. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Lai. Thank you very much. And well, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. You too. Wonderful. So uh, for a short break now, um, a quick word from our sponsors uh, and then straight to the next talk. Wonderful. That's it then. So uh, now we have a talk on satellite images analysis on Python for COVID-19 uh, from Ibrahim Muhammad. Uh, so Ibrahim is from Pakistan, but now he lives in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, he received the Developer 30 Under 30 Award. Uh, and his talk is about open satellite image and Python to visualize the environment impact, impact of COVID-19 on the planet. So stay tuned. Did you know that there are terabytes of new satellite images made available every single day for anybody to use? And in some of these images, you can actually see the impact of COVID on our planet. My name is Ibrahim Mohammed. I work at a satellite imaging company called Earthcast based in Vancouver, Canada. In this presentation, I will provide a quick introduction to open satellite imagery, how we can use this imagery with Python and how this imagery can be used to visualize the impact of COVID on our planet. Let's start with a quick overview of satellite imagery focusing on open data out there. There are various kinds of satellite imagery out there suitable for different applications such as agriculture, environment monitoring, disaster response, insurance, and many others. Satellites have sensors that read specific bands of the electromagnetic spectrum, typically in the visible infrared and microwave region. And each of these bands have their own properties and applications. Satellite imagery comes in a number of different resolutions. There is very high resolution imagery where you can see homes and cars. However, you can only look at a very small area at this resolution. If you want to look at a broader area, lower resolution imagery is more appropriate. There are various satellites that provide open data. There is the European Space Agency with its Copernicus program that has its central satellites made for various purposes. We also have NASA and USCS with their Landsat missions and have been providing imagery of the Earth for a very long time. There are various other satellites in addition to the, these. Let's take a look at three satellites that provide open, open data. First here is Sentinel-2. Sentinel-2 provides optical imagery, which means it uses the 
visible and infrared part of the spectrum. It provides a resolution of 10 meters, 10 meters every, every pixel on the image is 10 meters on the ground. Optical imagery as shown in the image above can be obscured by clouds. Sentinel-2 consists of two satellites. The, the two satellites work together, so any point on the ground is captured every five days. Next here is Sentinel-1. Sentinel-1 is a synthetic aperture radar Sentinel-1 uses the microwave part of the spectrum. It is an active sensor, which means that it emits signals that are bounced from the Earth and read in by the sensor. SAR imagery can see through clouds. However, it is harder to interpret, as you can see in the image below, that it looks very different from visible imagery. Another example of an optical satellite is Landsat 8 that provides 30 meter resolution and a 16 day revisit. Now that we have learned about a few different satellites, let's figure out where we can get data from them. There are numerous places on the internet where you can download satellite data. Here are two examples. The first example here is Central Hub's EO browser that provides a user interface for searching uh, imagery using your area of interest, time, and other filters. If you want to programmatically download imagery, you might find AWS Open Data more useful where you can find satellite imagery residing in an, an S3 bucket and you can use your tools you're, that you're familiar with, such as AWS CLI or Bodo to download images from there. Since satellite data is distributed by different vendors, it can come in very different formats. The spatiotemporal asset catalog or stack specification aims to solve that problem and standard, standardize catalog metadata. It consists of a JSON file that has important metadata such as the, the location and time of the imagery along with links to raster files and other metadata. Once you have found some satellite images, it is good to know certain details about the geospatial rasters these images come in. Firstly, these rasters can have any number of channels Typically, there is one channel per, per band of the electromagnetic spectrum that the sensor reads. These files also contain geospatial metadata that tells you about the projection of these images, as well as how can you go from one point on the image to coordinates on the globe and vice versa. These images are often very large, typically a couple of gigabytes. So it is useful uh, to have lower resolution copies of the same data stored in the image itself. These are called overviews or pyramids. So if you're only accessing the data at a lower resolution, you'll, you'll, you'll fetch the fetch one of the overviews instead of the full resolution data. Images are divided into blocks that help you read specific parts of the image instead of reading the entire image. And finally, to view these images, you require a special tool such as QGIS. Now that we have learned a little bit more about satellite imagery, let's see what Python packages are helpful in working with satellite data. Raster IO is essential when working with geospatial rasters. It is a, it is a wrapper around GDAL, Geospatial Data Abstraction Library. 
what it allows you to do is easily read, write, and transform geospatial data. In the code snippet below, you can see that it can be used to load in an image file as a NumPy array, as well as access metadata about this imagery. Another package that is really helpful is XArray. XArray is a wrapper around NumPy that allows you to label your coordinates. Let's say you want to access a subset of the imagery, you can, you can specify geographic coordinates to access the exact area instead of having to specify pixel coordinates. If you have done any plotting in Python, you probably already know about matplotlib. It is great for geospatial imagery because it allows you to create highly customizable plots as well as animations. Cartopy adds support for maps in matplotlib plots and can also be helpful sometimes. This year, COVID has created many challenges for us and has forced many cities into lockdown. The effects of these lockdowns can be observed from satellites. Let's take a look at how. One way is through high resolution imagery. You can monitor parking lots, ports, roads to see a change in activity. For instance, this image shows uh, Venice before and after lockdown. Before the lockdown, you can see a high level of boat activity, but after the lockdown, you barely see any boats. The other way is through air quality monitoring, and this is what we're going to focus on for the rest of this talk. There are many sensors out there that monitor air quality. But, but we're going to look at Sentinel-5P. Sentinel-5P was launched in 2017, and one of the things it can measure is nitrogen dioxide. Nitrogen dioxide is a gas produced by cars, factories, power plants, and other sources, including some natural sources, such as lightning and volcanoes. Ooh. Satellite imagery can see a decrease in NO2 levels during lockdowns. Central 5P data is hosted on AWS Open Data in this S3 bucket. And we can see that uh, for each date, there are a couple of files. And from here, we're interested in the 4326.tif file that contains the nitrogen dioxide le levels for a particular day. So based on this information, we can go ahead and uh, basically construct this S3 path uh, using the, a, a, speci a specified date. And um, then we can pass that URL into raster.io. Raster.io can handle S3 paths, and uh, we can uh, get a NumPy array uh, using Raster.io. And something we could do is instead of reading the entire file, we can specify a bounding box, a specific region uh, to uh, load. Another thing that's helpful is specifying an output shape because uh, we might uh, uh, we, we might want Maybe we might be looking at a large area and perhaps you want to only read the overviews instead of uh, the entire image. And this is uh, this takes care of that in the background. So once we have a NumPy array, let's try plotting it. The first attempt to plot it would be just passing it directly into IAM show. And what we see here is it's just uh, mostly yellow. We don't really see any details. So the reason behind that is that this data has a no data value. So the no data value is where uh, we do not, the sensor do not does not know what the nitrogen dioxide levels are. So for the purposes of our visualization, we're just going to set that to zero. 
Uh, the reason is because most of this data is close to zero and anything like a large negative number uh, doesn't show any of the uh, variations close to zero. So uh, once we plot this after removing the no data value, uh, we see there are some details there, uh, but uh, still it doesn't show a very good dynamic range we, range in there. So what we can do is we can ask uh, math.lib to uh, stretch this image or the colors in this image between two numbers. And uh, to do that, we specify the vmin and vmax args and we calculate vmin and vmax max to be the first and 99th percentile. So this way, any when matplotlib is uh, finding what color to use for a specific value, it's not using any outliers. So this looks great, but I can't tell from this image, where is this image for? So it'd be a good idea to add uh, country boundaries here. To add country boundaries, Cartopi uh, can do that very well. Uh, and it looks uh, somewhat the similar code, but uh, we have to specify uh, axis. Uh, we, we have to create an axis and specify a projection. And uh, when we call I am show, we have to also uh, tell it what are the extents of this image that we want to show. Um, so now this looks, this gives us more context around where uh, we are looking at. Another thing that I found was that most of these nitrogen dioxide uh, plots, they actually use the spectral color map. So I've, uh, I started using that as well. Um, and uh, the next thing I, you would want to do is create a time series animation. The thing with creating a time series is that you want to get rid of any kind of noise or local variations and uh, focus more on the long-term uh, variations in there. So to do that, uh, you can do a moving average. So you could do that with NumPy, but XArray actually has a very high level API to do that with image data. So here uh, you can uh, create a rolling average just using this rolling function on an array. Uh, once you have a moving average, you can use the existing plotting code, but uh, write a function that updates um, your image for a uh, certain day and pass this function into uh, animation dot function animation uh, in matplotlib. So the end result is this really cool looking animation. So putting this all together and narrowing into specific regions and times, we can see some examples where we can see lockdowns reducing the levels of nitrogen dioxide. So first example over here is of Wuhan, which uh, imposed a lockdown on 23rd January. And uh, we can see clearly here that before 23rd January, the nitrogen dioxide levels were quite high and uh, for Sometime after that lockdown, the nitrogen dioxide levels remained low. Similarly, in Europe, there was a lockdown uh, around mid-March, and uh, before that, uh, before that lockdown, the nitrogen dioxide levels are quite high. And uh, after it, we see that they have reduced. There's a large amount of publicly available satellite data out there and Python has some great tools to utilize this data. This data can be used for various applications, including monitoring COVID. Thank you for coming to my talk and I hope you enjoyed it. Cool, so thank you very much. Uh, that was awesome. Then uh, let's see, we still have a few minutes before the next talk. So uh, I'm gonna call to stage then, uh, Kevin. So Kevin is the director of Python Island. Hello, Kevin. Hello, how are you doing? How are things? Good, 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 good. How are you? Are you enjoying pajamas? 
I'm enjoying pajamas. It's uh, been a long old day, but I'm enjoying it definitely. Yes. Well, it's been a long day. I actually liked the geoprocessing one earlier, and that one that we just done. So, um, you know, excellent. Yeah, I, I do geographical uh, relation work, so those were great. Okay. Okay. Anything that you can bring on to to work then? Yeah, well, actually, they do it. The, my colleagues do that sort of stuff anyway. So it's just I'm sort of more up to speed on what they do. I do something complementary to that. I work with R at work, but, you know, so I understand more about what they do. My colleagues work with Sentinel and stuff like that. So a bit more illuminating about what they work with. Okay. There we go. Okay. Cool. So, like, very similar to reading a paper then. Very good. So, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And where are you streaming from? I am streaming from the west of Ireland. I'm streaming from a city called Limerick in the west of Ireland. So it's uh, not exactly the large, it's not, you know, exactly a large city. It's a, it's sort of, yeah, well, west coast of Ireland. So it's, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, I, yeah, it's, sorry, how, how, it's not i don't think it's particularly exotic i hear people from vancouver and melbourne and i'm thinking <laughs> wow and then limerick it's you know it's probably the same for them like they think melbourne yeah big deal but like it's like they, they, they might think limerick's fairly exotic like limerick so what's limerick famous for limerick's famous for uh, rugby yeah, and say. it's famous for it was the home city of the first actor to play Dumbledore. He was uh, Richard Harris. Obviously, he's been in a lot of other films as well. He was in Gladiator. <laughs> he was the Emperor in Gladiator, and he was ha he's had a basically a very long history in movies. But uh, you know, since the sixties, you know, so he's from this city as well. Uh, I did not know that actually. Yeah, there you go. So I uh, try to think of oh, the cranberries are from Limerick as well. <laughs> I don't know if anyone remembers them. Oh well, you know, I to, yeah, like when as soon as you talk uh, Ireland, the first thing that comes that comes to people's mind is the song and everyone just starts singing that song. So Oh yeah, good. Yeah. Excellent, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. So they're from Limerick. I already did not know that. Very good. There we go. I, I, there's other stuff as well. But, you know. well, okay. well, we won't brag. We're not braggers down here. <laughs> okay, that's all right. Oh, that's all right. And um, yeah, do you want to tell us a little bit more? Uh, yes, I can hear the echo. I just don't know where it's from. Uh, do you want to tell us maybe a little bit more about Python Island then? <laughs> Yes, um, Python Ireland has been on the go for 15 years, I believe. I don't know the exact date. I was corrected about this, but I believe it sort of started up at around the early part of the previous decade. I'm not quite sure when it formally got started. And uh, we've been having conferences for the last 10 years. And so we just had the 10th PyCon. Oh, sorry, that's... Uh, in 2019. So that was um, the last time we had a PyCon Ireland. Uh, we have one every year, usually in October or November. So hopefully they'll come back and hopefully next October, next November, we'll be able to ha start having real life events again. Maybe not as big as they were before, but maybe we'll get going again with the real life events and hopefully that Ireland, PyCon Ireland will be a thing again next year. Uh, uh, probably in the usual time period, late October or November. We're all helping each other again in real life, having quizzes and lobby sessions and all of that sort of stuff. That's my favorite part about conferences, just the random meetings in the corridors, you know, of old acquaintances and old friends, like, you know. So uh, that's what we're looking forward to. Uh, we're also trying to have some regional events as well uh, when we come back. You know, we're trying to sort of re uh, sort of uh, navigate a new future here as well because we think that virtual events are going to stay, and I think a lot of people like that as well. People from remote areas around the world 
that don't usually have a uh, that they don't usually have events that they get to be part of something big as well. So this is going to be a very interesting future that we all, will all have together. So we'll see how it goes. Awesome! Thank you so much for that. Yes. Uh, well, we're all looking forward to go back to in-person conferences and the chit chat and yes and the lightning talks and the yeah. queues and everything else even the queues were missing i don't have to queue <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes we miss everything but okay thank you and then david david markey is saying hello on the chat david is the ray of sunshine that brightens my world Oh. If only we could put him on there. He is a prince amongst men. David <laughs> Mackey is. We can try yeah. maybe on the next break, maybe. We can try. Oh, we can, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it'll be up past David Mackey's bedtime. He's usually very early to bed. He's a very sensible man. He likes to go to bed very early and get up very early and do very sensible things. That's his David Mackey. Well, it's the pajamas. It's the pajamas feeling. It's getting people to come with their pajamas. Very, very good. Uh, cool. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Lovely talk, chatting to you. Okay. Webcam is broken. Okay. <laughs> well, now cool. I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Then, so uh, Jasper, would you like to come on stage to say hello to us? Welcome. Hey, how are you doing? Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can hear you perfectly. How are you? I'm doing really well, thanks. <laughs> good, it's so good to have you here. When I saw your talk on the schedule, I was like, yay, he's joining us. Yeah, I, yeah, Chuck um, asked me to, to come on spontaneously, so I'm talking about <laughs> something a bit unconventional for me. I'm a bit nervous about that. <laughs> oh, no, come on. I know you're going to do great. Come on. So I'm just going to let you do your thing. Okay, mm -hmm. so welcome to Pajamas. And yeah, looking forward. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I'm Jesper. I do stuff online and I do machine learning and all that stuff. I should probably share my screen. I hope all this works. There we go. All right. So um, I have recently been really obsessed with Advent of Code. And I'll get into that um, in a bit what it is and why I'm so obsessed with it. But um, I really love it. And especially since it fits into a couple of theories I have about reinforcement and machine learning. And if you don't know what those are, that's fine as well, because I'll talk about those as well. I have 20 minutes to fill. And this is all very, it fits with a cozy pajamas feel. <laughs> like it's very um, improvised. So yeah, let's, let's see. Advent of code is this idea that you have an advent calendar for your brain. So essentially what's happening is that every year since 2015, um, Eric Watzel, a single person, if you believe it or not, sets up this amazing thing where each morning at um, midnight in Eastern Standard Time, a new puzzle unlocks. And you can solve those puzzles by hand or with code. People learn new coding um, languages or improve their Python. I use it to improve my Python, for example. And um, there's something different about it. And I, I want to talk about that. I've seen Eric's uh, talk online as well. And I think it's really impressive what he does in, in this project. First of all, like from a hardware standpoint, but also from the puzzle standpoint, because um, I think a lot of you have tried like things like lead code and hacker rank, where you improve your coding capabilities. Like um, before my my interview with uh, with Amazon, they told me to uh, to go to hacker rank and basically do um, programming challenges to improve my my coding capabilities and. While they're nice, I think they're missing something. Um, and it's nothing they can actually improve. They have a different target. So Advent of Code, you can go there, adventofcode.com. It's free. And each day you have this new thing. You can see it right here. 
I'm actually going to hide that. Um, it's quite nice. So this is from 2019, and it builds up. So in 2020, you you see a different image, and it's a different story as well each um, each day and each well each each year it's a different story, and each day you try to solve part of that story, which is cool. And also sometimes, sometimes, so I'm not gonna lie, I can't solve some of the problems. They, like they are very variable in their in their complexity. And some of them are incredibly hard. As you as you saw maybe on the on the last one, I haven't finished one yet. Mostly, well, because I just finished my PhD and I didn't have time to commit to this for a full month because some of them take hours to solve. At least for me, because I don't have the right um, right expertise in in some of the coding things that other th others have. But um, yeah, I I hope this year I'll I'll actually finish it. But um, yeah, you get this story, and there's always a first part and a second part. And the first part usually is a bit of a simpler version of the second part, which is really nice because in the first part you can all also uh, already build up a little bit how the second part is going to go which yeah that that makes it very interesting in a way to to see um to see how to generalize your code in different um environments so when you have a very specific problem of doing this one thing um you can think about all right how would i solve this for like a more general case. So one example, right, uh, that I solved today was assigning. Um, <laughs> it's very random, but if if you actually do it, it makes more sense. But assigning plane seats, and um, you want to find your one seat, and um, well, in the beginning, you're you're supposed to like um, calculate from a different code where your seat actually is. And then in the second part, you're supposed to calculate where it actually is in the seat. So from your ID, locate your seat. And um, it makes more sense in, in the aspect of this data because what, what really happens here is you have to think through your puzzle input, how to solve it in different ways, and it's... Like it's amazing. I I love this. Um, here you can see some stats on this, which is the other part that is very impressive to me. Down here, uh, oh no, <laughs> no. Let me try with a pointer. Uh, well, you can see the numbers. So the the finishing rate is clearly a like a long tail. Not everyone finishes in the end, but hundred thousand people get both of the um, experiments right on the first day. And for a single person that is running these experiments with different inputs, that is already an engineering feat. So this runs on AWS, but um, of course, Eric doesn't tell us a lot because security through obscurity, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff is hidden. This year, it actually happened that um, the servers crashed. Um, Eric managed to uh, have these huge warm-ups and all this balancing and like a lot of um, stuff behind it. He's been doing it for five years, but the server still crashed. And um, usually, that doesn't happen. Like when you see like hundred thousand people that op like from which ten thousand. I'll open it at midnight because there is a run for the leaderboard. Um, and the servers don't have any buildup, right? Usually when you have like um, balances on web servers, this balancing is happening over, well, you have a ramp up like on Black Friday. Usually people open up the websites a little bit before and there's a ramp up. Usually you can um, use load balances and they get accustomed to it, but not with advent of code. Advent of code literally starts on one day. It's like for the physicists among us, it's a Dirac spike. It's just getting very, a, a lot of traffic at once. And it's happening to a lesser degree, but it's still happening at midnight every day. 
um, which is just from a hardware perspective, even if you're in the cloud, even if you're scaling over different um, different clusters and all that stuff, like even if you run Kubernetes, it's a problem. And like, I, I think it's fascinating. Definitely uh, like after pajamas, look up his talk on how he does a lot of it. Um, but of course, like that's just my my admiration for this problem and for this project. Um, why do I love it so much? It's guided exploration, and this is also the thing that I kind of want to talk to, talk about today. Um, these puzzles always come with an input file, which is just a text file. So you already have to start by dealing with irregular text files. They're, they have different inputs for every day. And sometimes they're numbers in a text file. So when you read them in Python, you do your open with, uh, well, with open and um, get numbers in text. So you have to convert a lot of numbers that are um, in a list, which made me realize how powerful the map function is, for example, and things like that. So you, you start building up in these mini projects where you're where you're trying to solve a thing. And the really fascinating thing about um, Advent of Code is that there is no prescribed way. And that's my main difference to like HackerRank or LeetCode, where um, if, you, if you open those, it's usually um, that you open a lesson on KD trees. You open a lesson on efficient looping. And the, the problem there is you already know how to solve it. Um, there's no flexibility in approach. You're already told, do this to solve this, um, but within these parameters, solve this. And um, today, the, the solution, I don't want to spoiler it for you, but there were two very different um, approaches. There's a subreddit, and I, I love the subreddit with it because everyone is super helpful. And you can see like people are doing this even like in Excel and everything. But you can see what how other people solve this and therefore also see different approaches that you can learn from, which I, I, I love this about this because you have spent like half an hour, maybe an hour on thinking this problem through. And sometimes there are solutions that you didn't even think of and you're like wow this is really eye opening and um, i mean on a on a wider context this already tells the story why we do pair programming why we have other people review our code to see oh um right here if instead of this range you use enumerate then you get your index for free without having an additional computational cost things like that right so Seeing different approaches to this is amazing, and also not being told how to solve it. So today there um, there were hints in the solution to a um, binary space partition, which is a way of dividing up a space in um, yeah in a yes no fashion after after some rules and usually you do that by building up a binary space partition tree and usually building these trees is a little bit expensive because you have to preload all the calculation and uh, but then they're extremely fast so you can solve it in that way i solved it in a, it in a very different way which ended up being extremely fast and i was really proud of that solution and um yeah, sharing that then on the on the subreddit was really cool because someone actually answered to it and said, "Oh wow, that that is amazing. I'm gonna try that in my language." So they read my Py Python code and implemented in in their Kotlin. And like also, so um, in his talk, Eric talks about how how he spends a lot of time trying um, to make the text ambiguous. So you are not forced into a certain direction unless he wants to put a red herring in. That happens too. But um, usually these are so different people from different strokes can participate in this. Last year, um, we basically built a little compiler that was a robot, a robot that um, could like walk up, left, right, and then do something. And e with each puzzle, you build up 
um, this robot piece by piece. What I did was I learned about classes the first time um, because, I mean, my background is physics. So we do a lot of functional programming because it comes natural. But yeah, I, I build a robot class. I um, learned a lot in that process about different processing approaches. I built up a queue of, um, of input um, commands. And the interesting part is, I mean, I, I don't have a lot of experience in web development, um, like from, from an actual development. Like my websites are either static or run on WordPress. So I don't really have to do anything with them. And um, it was really interesting because um, the queue that I built was hand built essentially, just like a list that was built up. And then if, if a new command could be executed, that list would have would be called. People that have experience with web development directly went to asynchronous functions. I, I should definitely look them up. That's also kind of where, where I stopped because I didn't have more time to solve these um, problems. But yeah, like you can see so many different ways to solve these, which is amazing because this also gives you the opportunity to grow because um, I now know that I should definitely have a look at asynchronous functions, but I also know vaguely how they're used because in a web sense, it's like, it's sometimes a bit hard to understand them, right? Asynchronous functions, they kind of have to wait on inputs because sometimes servers are laggy. So like there's always a delay, so you want to wait, but it's, it's kind of abstract because I'm, I don't live in the web. I'm, I'm a physics person. I, I don't, I usually have my data right there on my hard drive, or sometimes I have to wait for my data to be loaded, but it's loaded and then I do something with it. It's not that anything has to really work asynchronous, mostly, <laughs> but yeah, it, it opens your eyes to these different solutions as well. Um, I think that was actually the, some of the key info already. Like um, one of the things that Eric is extremely proud of, and I think righteously so, is, is this approach of doing things ambiguous to give you the space to develop a creative solution. And this creativity is something I love, but you still have this guide of, there's a number you have to get out of it and the number has to be right. So you have confirmation as well. So there's a reward in the end. And for some, it may be natural where I'm going next. What does this have to do with reinforcement learning? Well, um, let's talk about what reinforcement learning is first. Reinforcement learning is a lot, has a lot to do with games. Essentially, it's showing a computer to play a game or more generally, it is showing a computer how to do something in an environment you define. And for some, for most of you, it may now be clear how this, how I'm making this connection. Because defining this environment is the most important step in your reinforcement learning um, approach. So when you set up your Game Boy or Atari games, they're quite popular in reinforcement. Or you play Go. This is directly taken from the um, DeepMind web page where they, yeah, they beat the one of the champions in Go with a computer, which everyone thought would be impossible. And it would be impossible without these um, reinforcement learning algorithms that essentially um, play against themselves and learn just based on the rules of the system, which is why reinforcement learning is making such strides in games. Reinforcement learning has been used to play computer games and beat humans in like actual 3D shooter situations and all that stuff. Um, but it is going into other fields as well. So reinforcement learning is being used in, um, in a lot of logistics as well, where you can define the parameters of your environment and think about it. Um, like think about it in a way that you just set an agent in there and the agent can explore curiously 
and you can set the constraints. Now, wh why do I think this is so similar to Advent of Code? Well, Advent of Code gives you an environment, like an, a reality you accept, and you explore that reality with, um, with or without, depending how, how much experience you have, um, with the experience you already gained. So when you're coming from a web background, you are probably finding a solution that is much closer to your space with asynchronous functions. When you list, uh, work a lot with arrays and lists, you're building up a list that is just appended and yeah, a queue system essentially. So really, um, reinforcement agents also learn with experience. And there's something interesting because, um, so um, AlphaGo, which was the agent that uh, won, won the, the game, was trained on actual, so initially it was trained on games that people played online. The next iteration was played without any. So it was just AlphaGo playing against AlphaGo and learning from that. And quickly, it became better than any other agent that was learned on human behavior, which is slightly frightening, but also really fascinating. Um, however, we don't all have Google resources, right? We, we don't have, um, like in some cases, millions of dollars to spend on, um, on cloud instances. And in this case, um, I've seen some really cool uh, things where people were playing Mario Kart and like training a reinforcement learning algorithm on Mario Kart and um, it would get stuck because if it runs into a wall, it's really hard for the, for the agent to get unstuck to learn that. But if you, in some cases, make interventions, so basically nudge it in the right direction, it learns much faster. So you're shortcutting some of the exploration and essentially doing pruning. Um, so you're you're making making some well you're optimizing some of the solutions because you're saying hey um, not that way we we want to stay on the street it's fine if we if we don't explore over there in the grass or in the water or in the sand because that's just not a solution we're looking for so oftentimes learning without any guidance um, is much more expensive it can lead to extremely beneficial outcomes. But um, it's it, like when I say expensive, it's computational, but computational in this case is on GPUs in the cloud. So it's actually expensive. And using guided exploration with these constraints can significantly improve your reinforcement learning. What does it have to do with machine learning? Well, um, in machine learning, what we're trying to do is to get a computer to find rules. And Oftentimes, uh, no, well, always it's based on data and sometimes it's based on labels or on sup unsupervised learning. But the idea is that the computer figures it out for you. So some strategies that are very similar to this guided exploration are feature engineering. When we already know that, um, for example, in housing data sets, very classical example, the, um, the raw features are square feet and price, but if we look at price per square feet, we have a feature that is extremely beneficial to figure out where, where something is placed because you pay much more per square feet when you're close to the water or when you're high up, things like that. Hard negative mining. When we know something is going wrong and we don't have more data, we can get the things that went wrong and refeed them to the, to the algorithm and do fine tuning on the things that got wrong. And like variance monitoring is something we can do like in Bayesian optimization, essentially um, go into the places of uncertainty. So when our machine learning algorithm is doing relatively well everywhere, but the variance of the outcome is higher in certain areas, we want to go into those areas to, so guide them to these areas to improve and gain more certainties. So we reduce the variance in those areas. And of course, data set augmentation. So <laughs> I just heard you work with Sentinel data. I do too. And um, we're just 
uh, which is contracting with a company that is doing, um, which is collecting a data set for us. We need labels. So they go in the field and they say, this is a plantation, um, this is man-made. And well, we can tell them where to go because sometimes, like, sometimes we have a lot of data just from um, interpreting satellite images, which is easy. <laughs> like looking at, well, relatively easy, but um, we, we can look at these satellite images and get easy solutions fast. Like we can look at water. The water is very easy to identify in most satellite images. But if we want cocoa plantations, it's really hard to distinguish a cocoa plantation from an orchard. So we actually need to calculate data there so we can guide our solution by actually getting more data in areas where we need more data. So having this kind of guidance within an open exploration field is really important as well. And this is kind of kind of an interesting thing that I just found during Advent of Code that to me seemed very similar between Advent of Code, machine learning, reinforcement learning, um, where you realize that um, opening up the, the parameters can be very, very beneficial. And sometimes guiding into the right direction is speeding up a solution very quickly. And that's all I have for today. Um, meet me online. I'm on LinkedIn. I have my website. Write me an email if you like. And yeah, thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jasper. That's a really good talk. And oh, you're gone. <laughs> Oh, I was about to have some chit chat with them. Oh, uh, that's okay. <laughs> um, oh, is they're back? <laughs> hey, oh, yes. That was the wrong button. Was not Anshul. Oh. That was Leaf Studio. <laughs> yes, that's like there's a actually uh, for people who don't know, there's a big red button at our backstage there, and lots of uh, speaker when they are testing, they just <laughs> disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I actually I don't see any questions on the chat, but I do have a question. I think it will be very useful for the viewer. Uh, so, what do you think is the most uh, dangerous pitfall for beginners who are starting to do some machine learning or you know uh, training some models? Like, what's the easiest I like mistake or wrong concept that beginners would have? Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very difficult question. <laughs> that is actually a difficult question. I, I feel like um, you have a lot of experience in machine learning too. What What is your opinion on this? Let me think. <laughs> okay. So I, I would think that a lot of people, they don't understand that actually sometimes training a very sophisticated model, they need a lot of data and a lot of time, a lot of resources. They just uh, overlook it and thought it's an easy job. So uh, they would, and then just go downhill from there. <laughs> I was one of them, so. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, now that you say it. So in the very beginning, I think it's very easy to find like easy data sets, like the Boston housing data set and MNIST, they're basically solved, right? There, there is no challenge in there. And uh, like going from there to actually applying work, um, like data is always messy. <laughs> like, um, and sometimes it's more messy, sometimes it's less messy, but there is no way around like data cleaning and also like making your, your data cleaning pipeline robust. Um, that's, that's definitely something and yeah, you're you're right. Also, going too complex too quickly, because um, to to build complex models, uh, you need a really good data validation. Uh, no, like uh, model validation. So you have to do cross validation, and you have to do it in the right way. And that's like, in my opinion, that's the the most important thing to learn in machine learning. Anyways, like the models don't matter that much. <laughs> like they do, <laughs> but they don't. Um, but model validation, like if you don't do cross validation and you don't do it in a right way, you're probably not getting a good solution. Um, and you have to kind of learn your ropes on that from, from the ground up, like going, going deep learning right away is probably a bad idea. <laughs> right. I think that's so true. That's exactly what I think as well. And, uh, so my last question, uh, if people want to learn more from you, where can they find you? 
Um, you I'm have all a over course, the internet. Right? <laughs> oh, you have a yes. course, right? <laughs> I, so if you already know Python, I have a data science course where I teach a lot of like this validation um, and like how to build up your your data science um, knowledge from data cleaning to exploratory data analysis to machine learning. Thanks for the pitch. Um, it's <laughs> on my website. I can give you a link if you if you write me an email. But it's also uh, if you find me on Twitter, um, it's just my name, Jesper Dramsch. It's right in the bio, so or yeah. in the first pinned tweet. <laughs> so it's or you everywhere. Can share, yeah, you, or you can share on Discord. Uh, just yeah, just let people I can do know. That, yeah. I think some of them may be interested, and there's also a data science uh, channel in the discussion. Mm -hmm. So it's quite quiet right now. I think people get a bit scared of data science, but uh, if Jasper you started, then maybe there will be some discussion there. Hopefully, <laughs> I can I can try yeah. and fan on the fire for for data science yeah. a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Definitely, team data science. <laughs> yeah. OK, so thank you so much, Jesper. It's good to see you again, and hopefully see you more in the future. Thanks for inviting me. And yeah, have a good rest yeah. of the conference. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. Bye. OK, so uh, that's Jasper and a very good friend of mine. And uh, yeah, so I think if you are monet like if you're looking at the YouTube chat, you see that actually we met in uh, in uh, yeah, Euro SciPy uh, one year in Trento. It was great. Like it, we we had we had fun. We had a good time there. Um, yeah, <laughs> I feel old when I talk about like my previous conference experience. But anyway, so uh, let's go on to our next talk. So uh, our next talk actually is a recorded talk. Uh, I think uh, Lace is at the backstage and helped me doing this right now. Could you share the talk so I can share it? <laughs> yes, yes, of course. So the next talk is Intro to a Lyra. So if you like to run your notebooks and you're wondering how to deploy your notebooks, just use a Lyra. Uh, we're sharing that now. Hello, Hi, everyone. Welcome to our today's session. We're going to bring you an introduction to your Lyra and AI centric extensions to Jupyter Lab. My name is Evan, and today I have my colleague here, Edward and Sashuti. So before we get started, I want to give you a brief intro of us and what's our day-to-day -day job look like. Um, I'm a data scientist, and I'm part of the Codate team. Um, my day-to-day -day job is to create machine learning and data science use cases using our data sets. Over to you, Edward. Hey, everybody. My name is Ed, and I'm also a data scientist on the Codate team. I work on a few of our projects here at Coday, including the Data Asset Exchange and the Model Asset Exchange. Hello, everyone. I'm Sashuti Swamnathan, and I work as a developer advocate and data scientist in Coday team. And thanks for joining us today. So just quickly, before we dive into the rest of our talk, I wanted to give you all a brief overview of everything that our talk will cover today. Um, so first, Sashuti is going to give you a short summary of the many projects we work on here at Coday. Next, Sashruti will go on and give a deep dive into one of the two Coday projects that we are showcasing for you today, and that is DAX, our data asset exchange. Then I will introduce you to our second project, Elira, which is a suite of AI-centric extensions for JupyterLab. Finally, Even will give a demo showcasing how you can combine both of these projects, DAX and Elira, to produce an effective and efficient AI workflow. And at the end of the talk, we'll also leave you with a few resources to get you started and up and running with Dax and Alira. Hello, everyone. Now, let's have a quick look at the Kodai team goals and projects. Kodai stands for Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. We are 30 plus developers and data scientists headquartered in San Francisco and distributed around the world, working towards contributing to open source projects. We contribute to both in house as well as external open source projects and cover entire data science pipeline. As you can see in the image, we have projects uh, you know, that can help you in gathering your data till maintaining your model. So to connect artificial intelligence solutions to real world problem, you need people who can understand both AI and the problems you are applying it to. So in many industries, you know, the only way to assemble both AI skills and industrial domain knowledge is to have a large cross disciplinary team. And this fact makes it expensive and it is also risky to deploy uh, artificial intelligence application because you need someone with a business, uh, you know, business knowledge as well as you know AI knowledge to maintain it. 
So what is our mission here? So our mission is to address this problem by democratizing AI, which is to make AI technologies accessible to the practitioners that understand real world problems so that they themselves can develop AI solutions that can solve their business problem. So DAX offers high quality weighted data. By weighted, I mean we start by tracing the origin and merit of the data set, learn about the usability rights and ownership. From here, we create standard metadata and perform internal legal review before releasing the data set. And these data sets have clearly defined open data license and we provide exclusive access to IBM research data sets that have played crucial role in building popular AI systems like AI debater, entity recognition, and so on. Each data set comes with tutorials that demonstrates the usage of data, and these tutorials can be directly exported as Watson Studio Notebook or Project. Next thing, we also provide data glossary to learn more about the attributes of the data set, an option to preview the data, to help users understand the data before using them. This will give them an overview of the data that they are planning to use in their application. Also industrial use cases. We have created uh, you no know, industrial use cases using the DAX data sets and they are available as Cloud Pack for Data Industrial Accelerator. And you can directly take these accelerator and plug into your or you no know, use it in Cloud Pack for Data. I have listed all the resources in the slides that you can refer to and know more about it. So this is our DAX page. If you click on learn more, you will have a detailed tutorial of what is DAX and what we provide as a part of this project. So if you want to know more about uh, you know, the recent launches, like if, if you want to know about, you know, the uh, recent releases, what you have added new, you can get into the what's new page. And if you want to connect with us, you can click on get involved. And you uh, it will take you to this repository. You can start creating issues here and being one of our team members, and we will be there to help you with your questions. So now I'm going to demonstrate to you all these features using two of our data sets. One is the PubLinet data set, which is one of our popular IBM research data set. So first, let's see about the landing page. So this is the data set. If you click on the tile, it will take you to the data set landing page. The data set landing page has a detailed and structured information about the data. First is the overview section. This overview section walks us through the data set, what it is, right? What this data set is about. So that information you can find under this overview section. Now let's get into the data set metadata. Metadata section has details such as format, license, which domain does this data set belong to, and how many data points we have. And let's say in your data, you have them in different split, like a split for training your data, the split for validating and testing your data. So how many data points you have under each split? So those kind of information you can readily get from this metadata section and you have information about the author, origin, and data coverage. Origin is nothing but where the data set is from, and data coverage is more about, you know, which areas in the specific domain does this data set cover. Also, we will end up with a business use case. So each data set is available in archive file. Uh, you can just click on get this data set to download the data set and it's in a okay, format, it's in tar format, which you can untar and extract the contents. So the next I would like to demonstrate the data glossary and preview. So we have the button here, try the data set 
write the data and notebooks. So you have the same metadata details here. So this is the preview page. We have previews tailored towards dataset format. This one is an example of image dataset. Right? So we have provided a way for users to get a feel of how the dataset will look like. Here you have one of the images in the dataset with this related annotation. So on the left side, you have the image. And on the right side, you have the annotation. When you take this annotation and overlay on the image, which you are seeing on the left side, you will get the middle image, which is the annotated image. So the annotated uh, image, you get it using the notebook. So if you want to know uh, a way for visualizing this annotation, we have the notebook preview option here. So this notebook preview option, if you click on the notebook preview, it has instructions to download and extract the data set and visualizing the data and to create models and so on. Now coming to data set glossary. To understand your data better, we have provided data glossary which is a list of terms with their definitions here. For example, you have, uh, you know, images. So what this image contains, right? You have annotation and you have different types of annotations, right? So if you want to know more about, you know, each term, know more about uh, the, know the correct description or the definition of the term, you get into the data set glossary. As I've mentioned before, each data set has assets associated with it. Asset can be either a notebook or a Watson Studio project. In this example, it's a notebook. So if you click on try this notebook, it will provide you an option for directly using this notebook under one of your existing Watson Studio project, or you can create a Watson Studio project and add this notebook to it. We also have some examples. If you see in our page, this is Envo AA weather data. And if you click on run the data set notebook, they are already available as Watson Studio project. So you can directly create a project here. And all the assets are already into it, so we can directly start using it. Cloud Talk for Data is a fully integrated data and AI platform that helps modernize the way you collect, organize, and analyze data to infuse in artificial intelligent applications. We would like our users to know how these data sets can be used in solving a business problem, not just stop with you know, model development, right? So we call these assets as industrial accelerator and can be directly used inside Cloud Talk for Data. So one example is this agriculture accelerator that I'm gonna show. It's loading. Yes. So the use case here is to monitor crop growth. Let me maximize that. Is to monitor the crop growth using a crop guide, which you're seeing here. And it provides timely alert to farmers about the weather change, possible development of crop diseases. You can see the list of diseases here. Evaporation of fungicide and efficient use of solar panels, which is agri old support. This is basically a shiny app as it is developed in our studio and you can directly deploy this app and use it as a starter application. So this is one of the example of accelerator. We just don't want people, you know, to just stop the model level. We want them to actually know where they can use this data sets in solving a business problem. So yes, I have covered this part. So I hope you all enjoyed this DAX uh, part and over to Ed for Elaira part. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Sashruti. So let's now dive into Elaira. At its core, Elaira is a set of extensions for JupyterLab catered to people who like to work with artificial intelligence and machine learning using notebooks. Elaira's goal is to help data scientists, machine learning engineers, and software developers through the most common model development lifecycle complexities. 
If you'd like to access the GitHub repo or the docs for Elira, you can follow the links we've shared here on the screen. Elira was officially announced as an open source project by IBM this past April. Elira boasts a host of features to achieve its goal, which we'll discuss shortly. For now, notice from the preview Elira's UI on the right here that Elira doesn't radically reinvent Jupyter Lab to provide you with all of its enhanced functionalities. It simply extends the distinct Jupyter Lab environment that we've all come to know and love over the years with added tabs, toolbars, and launchers. So what can Elira actually do for you? Well, you can really break down Elira's core features into five items. The first, Elira provides an easy to use notebook pipeline visual editor. Why build your next AI model using a pipeline editor? Well, it's because Elira provides a simple visual way to convert multiple notebooks covering pre-processing steps, experimentation, optimization, and deployment all into batch jobs or workflows. Second, Elira supports running notebooks as batch jobs directly in the UI, making model training easier. Third, Elira supports easy creation and insertion of reusable code snippets. This allows users to manipulate reusable pieces of code, making programming in JupyterLab more efficient by reducing repetitive work. Fourth, Elira pipelines support Git version control, allowing rollbacks to working versions of the code, backups, and most importantly, sharing amongst team members. And fifth and finally, Elira exposes Python scripts as first-class citizens. This allows users to locally edit their scripts and execute them against local or cloud-based resources seamlessly. Even will now demonstrate all of these features for you in our demo. Thanks, Ed, for the overview of uh, basic functions of Elira. So before I go into a live demo, I want to introduce you what is a pipeline. So a data science pipeline usually includes five steps from data extraction to result interpretations. And let's think of this with a simplest example, uh, such as a Python script. What you do is you typically read in some data, do something with the data, for example, machine learning or deep learning models, and then push the stuff you want to keep to a file system or save it or output the files. And then run this on a scheduler or somewhere else. Elira makes it possible to run Python notebooks instead. I mean, why running Python scripts when the Jupyter notebooks are so much easier? Usually the notebooks make things a lot easier to understand, it's more intuitive and have each component to run together continuously and iteratively. It means you can always come back and go forward, you can delete some cells and do whatever you want. It also makes it easier to tell the story behind the pipeline. And it might grow bigger as a project. You can think of this as a novel. In that case, we would like to break them down into smaller chapters, basically easier to maintain in the long run as well. It also brings in a benefit that if your notebook doesn't have a dependencies on the prior notebook, it means you can run them parallel or you can run them sequentially. Some notebooks might have different requirements than the others, like libraries, framework, file dependencies, environment configurations, etc. We want to make the pipeline eventually portable and shareable, so we need to take these factors uh, into account. And we need to configure these uh, for each notebook separately. We can run Elira in containers, uh, such as Kubernetes, and this will save time and save memories and GPUs because you can run things parallel. And workers can have different hardware configurations to accommodate various workloads. Clusters can also scale up or down, depends on your resource need. Also, if you need to change anything in one notebook, you don't have to re rerun the other notebooks uh, by clicking them through. Elira will save your efforts by constructing them as a pipeline and run them all with one click. So now let's go into a live demo and let me show you how to run this. Also, there are several prereqs to run. So before we get started with Elira, please check on the list, see if you have everything installed. Also, I copy paste a few easy code snips in here. Uh, to install Elira, you can run this in your local machine on your terminal. Um, and also you can verify the installations. And after everything is complete, you can start the Elira by running JupyterLab. Lab. 
And also feel free to check out the code on Elira GitHub repo to clone, to fork. And also you can check out on the Elira documentations. Okay, let's get into a demo. Now, let me walk you through a demo by running four notebooks using Elira. I will introduce you two ways to run your pipeline, both on local machine and on Kubeflow pipelines. To build a pipeline, you can simply drag and drop the notebooks onto the canvas and then connect them, just as easy as drawing a graph. You can arrange the notebooks in sequential or parallel order. You need to configure notebook properties for several informations. We put the environment variable dataset URL as a dataset download link from DAX. We copy paste the link into a section. This notebook produced output files, so I specify the file name as gfkweather.csv, which is downloaded through the first notebook into a directory. The output files are uploaded to the cloud storage or saved in local directory after a notebook processing complete. We also need to select a Docker image that will be used to run the notebook. You can bring your own image or choose from the predefined public images. We choose pandas as a Docker image here because we mainly use pandas and NumPy packages in the notebooks. We could only select one Docker image each time. However, if you're running on a local machine, the image you choose does not matter. Also, you can declare the file dependencies as jfkwilderclean.csv, but this is not necessary since files are already in the same folder. I redefine the name of the pipeline by right-clicking my trackpad, changing the name to even.pipeline. Also, you can add comments to provide short descriptions. This helps your colleagues know the function of each node before going into it. Now, everything is all set. Let's save the pipeline and submit it to run locally. The running logs are shown in terminal. If everything completes successfully, a message will pop up. The run outputs will be shown in the notebook cells. See on the left side, the notebooks are just updated a few seconds ago. Now, let me quickly walk through the content of each notebook. Firstly, the load data notebook downloads, extract the zip file through the dataset URL link, and save it as a jfkweather.csv file. The part one notebook loads the dataset downloaded from the previous notebook replace the wrong values such as non t 0 0.0 to 0 0.01 second, filter out everything out of the range, converts columns to numerical types, clears out missing values, renames the columns, and then save the clean dataset as gfk weather clean .csv file. The part two notebooks select the five columns from the clean data and visualize the trend. Also, it explores the dependencies between each, the five columns. Then it visualizes the trend of the rolling average in 2017. In the part three notebooks, this explores the approaches to predict future temperatures by using the time series dataset. It creates training, validation, and test split, and then it trains the dataset and then compares the performance between different baseline models using the main mean squared error. And it built a RIMA model predictions for the first 48 hours of the validation set. You can get the notebook on DAX page by clicking on preview notebooks you can see we have three notebooks very similar to what we have in demo pipeline. The notebooks were designed to run on Watson Studio and IBM Cloud. I made minor changes to the notebooks to fit this into the Jupyter environment. Now let's submit and run this pipeline on Kubeflow. Before running, you need to configure a runtime by putting your credentials into each section. I already pre-configured my runtime, so now let's submit the pipeline on Kubeflow. In the run process, Elira generates, gathers, and packages the required artifacts, upload them to cloud storage, and triggers pipeline execution in the selected Kubeflow pipeline environment. The pipeline runs are listed in the experiments panel. The graph panel displays the execution status of each node. 
you can see the Part 1 notebook is completed and has green check mark at the right top. After the run is complete, you can access the pipeline's output artifacts using any supported S3 client. In here, we have all input and output files listed. Clicking on the data folder, which includes the JFK data file and the clean version. All tarballs are input files. By clicking on one of the output files and download, you can see the result of the notebook is saved in the output cells. So if you want to get involved with Celera, please visit our GitHub repo and open enhancement requests or back reports. Also, I copy paste a few related links to our talk today and feel free to check the bit.ly pyjamas dash Elira. We have our presentation listed on the link and thank you. Right, so that's the end of this section. And um, yeah, we have so many great talks and we are not stopping here. <laughs> Yay, Lays, you're back. Hey! Yes! So good! Another slot done! Yes, yes, yes! Very good! Yeah, yeah. You, you can still see that we are still having energy and the party is not stopped at here yet. So um, we'll continue because even though it's nighttime for us, it is not nighttime for everyone in the world. That's why uh, we do this. Okay, so uh, what ha what's going to happen is that uh, we would have the technical break uh, in five minutes. And well, I, I like you being transparent. <laughs> you are just like, I don't know, you're like a cotton candy now. It's like transparent, it's soft. It's like, oh. Okay. <laughs> I, I think corn and the sky and being transparent. It's the fight <laughs> <pyjamas> effect. <laughs> okay, I will stop being weird. And um, so, yeah, we will have the technical break in five minutes. And uh, so, uh, some kind of housekeeping announcement. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, if you have missed our announcement before, that we have uh, the, the Competition. Oh my God, it's getting late. The pajamas competition. I have I have another uh, costume change, so maybe I'll post another picture. So please, please, please uh, post uh, your best pajamas picture to enter into the competition. And uh, if yeah, you know people will come in and vote, and then they would give you a thumbs up if they like your outfit. Uh, if the, the 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 outfit that got the uh, most uh, thumbs up, we would pick two of them uh, that they can win a uh, a bring jet. Uh, license that you could buy a lot of their products. Uh, you could buy a pie charm, which is worth sixty nine pounds. Uh, you can also, you know, if you use other tools, uh, you know, if or you already have a pie charm, you can buy other things as well. So that's a really good deal. So I hope uh, people can come in and join. And oh, Martin is still in the chat. Oh my God, you are a night owl. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, please uh, have fun. Uh, that's the most important thing and put on your pajamas, uh, no matter whether you just woke up or you're going to bed or it's in the middle of the night for you, it's weekend, you may be relaxing or something, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so uh, other thing is that uh, we actually uh, have a Discord channel. <laughs> if you hasn't realized that, uh, we do have a Discord channel. That's where the competition is happening. That's where the chat with a speaker is happening. That's where all the uh, our sponsor Microsoft Swag is uh, posting there. So if you haven't joined Discord yet, uh, you have to join. So how to join? Um, if you have registered for a ticket, you should get our email uh, at some point and there's an invite link that you can join there. Uh, if you haven't registered for a ticket, why didn't you register for a ticket? <laughs> so go to our website, uh, that's um, pajamas.live and you can register a ticket there. So um, that's what you need to do. Um, oops. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, maybe I clicked the wrong button for some reason. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, things are going weird. Like the later it got, the weirder it gets. Okay, um, so uh, so that's that. Uh, anything else, Lace, that you want people to know? I would like to remind everyone that our sponsor, our Kashmir sponsor, Microsoft, has swags. So make sure you go to the Discord channel and the Discord server on the the Microsoft Windows. Um, Microsoft sponsor channel and grab your swag because swags are always good. Yes. Yes. So uh, please, uh, you know, register, 
go to Discord, have fun, and maybe have another hot chocolate. I'm really tempted to get another hot chocolate. I was talking with Lace about like we may have because she's have she's been naughty and having some like midnight slacks, and like I was trying to like uh, lose weight, so I'm like no. <laughs> but I'm really tempted for hot chocolate now. I've been talking about it all day, and I really want a hot chocolate. So maybe I would get one during the break. Um, so uh, for people who want to um want to keep on watching uh we would actually uh, ending this stream very very soon uh if you are using our playlist to watch uh, it will just automatically go to the next playlist so you're all set you can relax uh but otherwise uh please go to our youtube channel and so you can actually search us by pajamas con or the link is actually in the discord <laughs> um but yeah like it just just uh, always on our twitter yeah, is uh, the link to our YouTube channel is also on our Twitter. So uh, yeah, go to our YouTube channel, find the next stream. is uh, It should be stream four. It uh, starts at half uh, half twelve in the midnight for UTC for us. Um, and so I think that's it. Uh, so how about now we would uh, play the our sponsor ad? Uh, our, our friends from Microsoft give us swags like lace said that. So uh, make sure you check that out. And um, I'll see you in the next stream. We will see you in the next stream. Bye. <laughs>